Good afternoon, everybody. This is DJ Armani, and I am here to welcome you to Athletics Productions. Today, I'll be joined with my co-host, Victor, and one of the leading British sprinters, OG Edaburan. Please, OG, <laughs> tell us about yourself. Well, you've done a good job of introdu introducing me already. Um, yeah, my name's OJ, like you already said. Um, 100 and 200 meter sprinter um, from Great Britain and yeah, trying to make some noise in the next few seasons to come. Okay, trying to make some noise. Mm -hmm. How has training been going for you currently? Um, training's been going really well this year. Um, I took some, obviously I'm in my second year now with my coach, so okay. um, we've kind of had our first season of like getting to know each other, getting things right, getting things wrong, and just me getting used to a new program. Um, but now this year, I feel like I've kind of come in at a more accelerated rate um, than last season. And it showed in my training and in my development. And um, I'm feeling really confident for this indoor season coming up. Okay, so you're going to be doing indoors? Yeah, yeah European indoors, yeah. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. So question, European indoors is your target? Yeah. So that means you're going to be taking part in the 60? Yeah. Correct? Yeah. All right, cool. Are you going to be doing anything else over the indoor season? You know, dabble in the two? Absolute myth. Maybe stretch it out to a four? <laughs> Absolute myth. Um, people say to me, oh yeah, you should do a 400. You've got the limbs for it. You've got the limbs. I'm sorry, let me just make, give a disclaimer right now. I'm never, ever doing a 400 meters in my career, ever. 200, the fingers of the 200, um, I wouldn't mind doing it, but I feel like there's not a lot of good tracks in the UK for it. I think Birmingham Indoor is probably mm. the best one um, that probably mirrors what the indoor tracks are like in America. Okay. But when you've got a hard banks, I think it's just, it's just um, an injury risk and it's, it's just not necessary, so. I don't, yeah, you I don't, don't really do, do much 200 like on your part of 10 it's like oddly any 200 it's yeah this, 160. this is the thing like i always say to my coaches whoever i've been with over the years i want to do some twos this year i want to do some twos but when the season kind of starts and like Focus let's say james. i'm doing 100 and then I, I, it's not really going well blah blah okay i want to do more hundreds to try and fix it so okay. i never really have time for the two but i think in uh, on reflection now moving forward with the two i think for me I'm not. I'm. I'm more of a speed-led athlete rather than say an endurance athlete. Okay. So I don't feel as though I'd run sub twenty from doing a load of endurance work and tempo runs. It's gonna be from coming into it with a lot of speed in the tank anyway. Mm -hmm. Sub ten speed is what I want. So for me, my focus is to run sub ten first, and then I'm gonna move over to the twos and try and do what I can in that event because I feel like I want to be a master at the 100 first before I take my, my um, focus over to 200. So that's kind of my thoughts on it now. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you said about your training program being different. Yeah. What's different about this particular program as opposed to the ones that you've done in the past? Um, I, do you know what? I wouldn't really say that it's completely different. As I feel like these days as one you see on Instagram, everyone's an Instagram coach these days. Like yeah. you see on Instagram, um, everyone's kind of doing the same thing. You've got to accelerate, you've got to do your tempo runs and your long work. You've got to do your gym, you've got to do your core, you've got to have therapy. We all do the same thing. Yeah. But I think what separates people is how you do it, the detail you have in doing it, and how effectively you can um, convey that to, to your athletes. So for me, um, now I'm with Steve Fudge, I was with Jonas before, and they've kind of come from the same mentors that being in Dan Path, your, your Vince Anderson. So the programs are not really that different. Okay. I think for me, it's more so the mindset I have coming into it, the environment I'm in is obviously different. And um, I think probably just the way things are being translated to me, I can understand it maybe just a bit different than I did before. Okay. Um, and sometimes you just need to just have a different, like perspective on how you're doing something. It could be the exact same thing, but if you did it slightly differently, you just might get different results. So that's kind of, that was kind of my reasoning in, um, yeah, in moving coaches, I guess. Okay, cool. I'll touch on that one yeah. in a second about mm -hmm. moving coaches. Yeah. Um, so on a, on a weekly basis, how often do you train? Uh, so we train f uh, five times a week. Okay. So we'll go Monday, acceleration. Tuesday will be like more of our endurance. Wednesday's mm -hmm. a day off. But it's not really a day off because it's therapy. Okay. I've got to either travel to Oxford or Stevenage or wherever I've got to go to get therapy. And then Thursday's a repeat of Monday, Friday's a repeat of Tuesday, and then Saturday's like a general strength type of day. Okay. So that's that's pretty much my makeup for the week. Okay, so it's kind of like 
six, it's five and six days at the same in time. In a way, it's, yeah, in a way. Okay, that's way. that's cool. So you pretty much do speed the whole year round. In, in a yeah, in a way, I think obviously certain aspects of the year we won't be hitting speed as aggressively as maybe say a few weeks out from an indoor race. Yeah, but generally it's a speed program that like we have acceleration elements um, in the program. I think at different points of the year it will be a lot of it and then other points would be a bit less of it but it's all about it's like a seesaw you know to kind of have the balance of yeah. the two and not letting the other suffer so that's the balance i guess and that's the job of a coach to kind of find that balance for the athlete well balance is a balance is a very interesting thing because a lot of people say that balance has to be 50 50. yeah i kind of think well it could be 60 40 or 70 30. Totally, i think it just depends but on who you are as long as the balance is there yeah it doesn't matter which way the percentage goes, as long as it's there, you're gonna have it. It's gonna be different for every athlete. Like some people are endurance led, some people are speed led, some people are God knows what led. Like there's different roads to Rome as people will say, right? Yeah. So there's no rule like, if you don't do this, you can't run fast. Like I've heard so many different stories of athletes who have run crazy quick and hadn't even gone past 150 meters that yeah. year in training. Like some maybe not even past 100 meters. Some who were on the bike, for majority, Donovan Bailey, 96 weeks from the Olympics was on the bike. He yeah. was even running and he bought the world record. So I'm just, it, it just say that to say, there's there's many different ways to get to where we want to go to. So that's what I say. So like last year, you came out, you changed coaches and mm -hmm. then you came out, you ran 6.58? 58, first race Yeah, year. 58. And yeah. what were you thinking? Like, obviously <laughs> you've changed coaches. I've, yeah. As everyone says, you change mm -hmm. coaches, everything yeah. goes down. Yeah. That's what they expect. Yeah. What, and in reality, you just kind of improved. It was crazy. Like, I think even the profile of myself so far in my career has just been a bit, one of those ones where it's kind of like been like up and down in a, in a way. Um, but with my new coach, I guess when I went to him, um, I was coming from a place of, I didn't really have a lot of confidence. I think not making the 2017 World Championship team, I lost a lot of confidence. And I was kind of just questioning myself like, right, am I actually, you know, good enough? To, to do the things I'm trying to say I want to do, I haven't seen the results. So in moving to him, I kind of just had a blank canvas. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to listen. I'm going to take in everything you want me to do and see where this goes. So, and we don't do timing in training. It's okay. in like, we time obviously like long runs, but we don't do like timing for speed. So yeah, yeah, everything's yeah. based on feeling and consistency and movements. So I thought, well, it's either going to be six, six mid or like a six, seven. I honestly didn't know because the, 2017 indoor season, I ran six seven, but I, I pulled my my groin, but even still, I ran six seven indoor, so I didn't have no reference of any fast 60. So coming out 58, um, I wanted to do it, but I didn't think it would come out first race. So I was like, yo, like okay, we're in business sort of thing. Um, so I, I probably, I probably, I ended up in 56. I probably should have gone a lot quicker, um, but opened up so well. I probably should have ended up with like a six five low, to be fair, but. Um, yeah, it was a good time. It was a good time for me, my coach. I would say that. Yeah, because you didn't. Did you decide not to go to the Commonwealths? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is what happened, right? Ooh. Um, and it, they picked because it was so early. They picked the team from like last the se based on the season before, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what it was was that I didn't get picked for the hundred initially. It kind of they went in like I don't know what the criteria was. I never even read it to this day, but I didn't get picked. And obviously a lot of people were declining it, accepting it, declining. So no one really knew um, where Watching they stood. The girl, yeah. But I got a phone call midway through the indoor season saying, oh, yo, do you want to come come with us for the relay? People are dropping out. We need someone to run. And for me, like I was in the point of training where I'm now competing. I'm focused on the 60. Like I'm not going to divert my focus towards the Commonwealth competition, Games in competition Australia. Yeah. Like that's just random. <laughs> like I, I know there's some things in life you can do spontaneously, but that just wasn't part of my plan. So it just wasn't something that attracted me really. So I guess what I'm saying is I didn't get invited initially, then got asked like, I think for me too late. Yeah. So yeah, it just didn't make sense for me. So what you're saying is, I'm not an afterthought, essentially. Take it how you want to take it. <laughs> Fair but enough. the truth of it is, I guess to a certain degree, I'm saying that, but um, yeah, it just didn't make sense for me. Like this didn't make sense for me. Maybe if I was going for the hundred meters, and I'd planned it with my coach and whatever. It could have been a good medal opportunity because, you know, like 10 one high was getting medals and yeah. stuff like that. Like it was probably a good development competition for me to be at, but I just wasn't in the plan. So it just never happened. Fair enough. Yeah, it just Fair never enough. happened. So let's let's roll back the clock. Okay. 
say six, seven years. <laughs> I don't remember what I looked like <laughs> six, seven years ago. <laughs> well, I can pretty much, I'll probably say that you look pretty much the same, maybe a little bit shorter. Bro. <laughs> a little bit less muscular. I'm in the gym, you know, pumping weights. So I'm telling me I look the same. What's going on? You were quite bit, you were quite, you know, broad for your age. Yeah, yeah, so it's cool. Yeah, we yeah. Can, okay, it's okay. fine, it's okay, fine. Okay, you saved it, you saved it. You I saved, saved you, it. Saved don't it. worry, I got you. <laughs> Starting out in the sport, mm -hmm. what drew you to athletics? Yeah. Because it's very rare that you find someone who just came to athletics. Yeah. So what was their football? Yeah. You were quite tall. So mm -hmm. was they trying, was your school trying to push into basketball? basketball. <laughs> Yeah, I tried what all those. What came before? I tried track. all those sports, like um, like anyone growing up in the ends, you want to be a footballer, you want to yeah. make it out, you want to have the flash lifestyle and blah, blah, blah. Obviously I tried to do that, it didn't work. I had the speed, I had, mm -hmm. um, I could finish, but like, I just didn't have the endurance. Like, but, and because I was quick, everyone just kept kicking it over the top, expecting yeah. me to rush every time. <laughs> yeah. And I was just getting cramped, I was no getting cramped. <laughs> I couldn't hack it, it was just mad, innit? So that didn't work out for me. Mm -hmm. I did a bit of basketball, um, but I think I don't think I was tall enough, so that didn't okay. really work out. Um, tried to do a bit of rugby, but I quickly found out that I don't want someone elbowing me in the face. I'm just not on that. So um, yeah, <laughs> after trying all those sports, um, I was actually at a Sports Day at Lee Valley where I train okay. now, and um, I ran the last leg of a relay. And one of the workers here, Peter Scott, um, he still works here till today, and he was basically just like, "Yo, you need to come down to the track and train." Blah blah blah, and I was just like, mm, okay. So I'm going to my friends. I'm like, I got, I got scouted. I got scouted for <laughs> athletics. I'm okay. gonna, I'm gonna do this thing. I did athletics. Blah blah blah. So, yeah, um, I didn't even. And to be fair, from the day he told me to when I actually came to the track was like six months later. That I was very much just like holding it off because I wasn't really sold on it. Okay. But then when I came to the track, when I saw all the athletes, I, I, I joined up with Eddie Stevens. At Enfield and Hangate, and we, we trained in the evenings on the Tuesday and the Thursday. And yeah. when I came down, I saw the athlete, saw everyone sprinting. I came in Air Forces. I did the session in Air Forces. Like I was really not prepared. And when I, when I came to track and I saw everyone, I said, you know what? This is where I want to be. Like it's competitive. I like the banter. Different atmosphere to football. But it was different, different to football. More individual. Like, like everything about it. I just felt. I remember the night. I remember that like it was yesterday. I remember coming to the track and I just fell in love with it. And I thought, right, this is what I'm gonna do. When I got home, mom, I need spikes. I need a new trackie. I need this. I need that. And and yeah, it's just fell in love with it since then. How old were you then? Um, good question. Uh, I think I was just turning sixteen. So I guess someone would say it would probably start a bit late. Um, but I developed quite quickly, so I kind of made up the time I wasn't in the sport. Let's say. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So, first competition. Mm -hmm. How did that go? <laughs> if you if you can remember back that far. Uh, I remember. I remember it very clearly. I think my first competition was the Middlesex Outdoor County Champs. Okay, cool. In um, Mile End. And um, I remember I ran, I made the final, I ran 11.64 with a 3.8 or something like that. And Behind obviously I did- or in front? No, wow, I came last. I came last. Under 17, I came last with that. And um, I remember, I remember going on power of 10 and obviously when your times are windy, they don't yeah. want to come up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, Where's my time? Where's my time? I ran 11.64. I'm ranked 380 in the UK. Where's my time? Yeah. Getting vexed. And then like, no, when you run windy, I even emailed them. And when you run windy times, obviously it don't count on the rankings and whatever. So I was like, oh, okay. And um, then I looked at the female rankings and they were all faster than me. And I was like, yo, I've got a way to go in this chat thing, don't I? Mm. But it, it, yeah, it was a season of just developing. I finished the season with 11.18, I think. That was my last, yeah, my, my last race of the season, I ran 11.18. And um, that was that was the fastest time I ran in my first season in athletics. So I think I took, yeah, half a second off in my first season, which was good. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, it was good so times, man. How long did it take you to get your first, like, should I say, national medal? Like, before you went international? Yeah. So like uh, English schools or yeah. counties? And I, I went, well, I went to English schools in 2012. 2012 was a bit... Like it was a bit tough because I was I had I had you hamstring in injuries. Hmm? You went in my year. Did I go in your year? Yeah. <laughs> no way. Yeah, you would have gone in my year. Yeah, I went. I went 2012. I went to English schools. I was a, I was a, I was a last year under 17, and um, like I used to have this issue with like pressure, and I, and I still I had that, that issue up until maybe like 2017. Okay. Um, I'd always overcook 
kind of like the magnitude of the competition mm-hmm. and obviously when you're putting a lot of pressure off you dehydrate a lot quicker and I always used to cramp up all the time in big races you probably all like trials I'd cramp cramp up quite a lot at trials it happened to me even this year um and loads of other junior competitions but I went to the first round and cramped up and I was like god why like why me like why anyway cramped up bombed out and then um my first national medal essay was in the indoor 60 meters in Birmingham. Um, did my first year joining Oakland College, my first year um, as an under 20. And I remember going there and there was loads of guys who were faster than me. I think I'd gone in there and my best was like six, 80, 80 something, 90 maybe, I don't know, I can't even remember. And it was a sick day for me because that was like, kind of, not the boy becoming a man, because I was very much still a boy. I was like 16, 17. I was 16 actually. Um, And I came second to CJ, my training partner at the time, and I ran 688, I think he ran 668. So he was just, he shouldn't have been in that age group that year, man. They should have let him go seniors, because he was just way better than everyone. He He was a third year under 20. So he was just a big man, (laughs) battering (laughs) boys. This this has always been the thing from, from way back, because yeah, 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 yeah. obviously there are some people who managed to sneak yeah. a third year as yeah. a I, I got the third year, and I was the one in 2015 who was bossing and it, so <laughs> I enjoyed my time. I enjoyed my time. It, it I was one of those it. ones where it's like, if you're a third year and you ain't saying nothing, yeah. it's like, it's long, it's well, long. what did you do for the three yeah. years? You need to go get a, you need what, to get a regular You need job. to go find a new career. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, okay, so, th- so yeah, you were a third, third year. year. And I was first year. And obviously being a first year getting a medal was big things because yeah. obviously usually that like, first year at that time rare. weren't really getting that. So six, eight year and I was like, I was so, it was such a good time. And then the next day Reese won the 200 and we were just like, cause we lived with each other on campus at Oakland okay. College. This is in St. Albans. So it was just a sick time for us because we were, as under 17, we weren't really the guys. So yeah. to come like literally less than a year later and start bossing our age group, it was it was a sick time for everyone. And we're all in the same training group. So it was just- So was while you time. were at Oaklands, yeah. were you still was under still, Eddie? Uh, um, no, so I had moved over to Jonas, Jonas, that, Jonas okay. and Ryan Freckleton that year. Okay, so they were the- yeah. So Ryan Freckleton is the guy who basically founded um, Oaklands Athletics. Okay. And um, at that time, the program wasn't really as big as it as it is now, because obviously yeah. Cause he's many done. people have come through that program now. Yeah. But we were kind of like the, f- I know people who came before, but we were the first kind of really talented ones that came through. Mm-hmm. Um, so Eddie referred us. It was kind of like a really, it was a really easy transition. So listen guys, you can get, um, you could do your education. You could get really good training, SNC, track, therapy. This whole package is here, just live on campus. And for me, I was very much like, I wanted to get out of the house. I wanted to kind of, you know, like explore a bit in my teens, innit? So yeah. it sounded good to me. All the, all the men were like, yeah, let's go. So it was like all the boys were kind of going. So it was yeah. it was sick. We were just like, yeah, let's go. So it was a wild time anyway. But Was was that something that you had to pay for as such? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It? So I got, I got, I was lucky enough to get a bursary, which okay. made it a bit cheaper. Um, but essentially my mum my and dad helped pay for that for the two, three years I was there. And um, yeah, so I was with I was with Jonas um, and I was with Ryan, and they basically were the guys who took me through my whole junior career. So that was a it was a very very good time. So like, just to refer back to something you said. So the under seventeen, mm-hmm. you said you guys weren't saying much. <laughs> a year, a year later, even less than a, a year. A year later, mm. you've now come and you've gone to World Juniors. Yeah, World Youths. That was that World year. World Youths. Mm. Sorry. Mm. What was that like? How was that for you? Because that's a big thing. Like yeah. very, very few people mm-hmm. get to go mm-hmm. to these competitions. So mm-hmm. when you think to yourself, last year, I was just about like making the final mm. and coming in the top eight mm-hmm. nationally. Yeah. Fast forward a year, I'm now world youths. Mm-hmm. This is like the best of the best for my age. Mm-hmm. Tell us about that. Yeah, this is, this is, this is a good, this was a, this was one of those times in, in, in life that like, you know, when you're just on the journey mm-hmm. and like everything's just going your way. Like everything was just getting better and better. Each race was just getting better and better. It was just one of those points in my life where it was just, everything was just sick. Like I was naive to what I was doing as well, which I think mm-hmm. is sick. And that's something that I would, we could probably talk about later in terms of what sometimes you lose when you try and transition into yeah. a senior athlete. But I was just very naive. I just knew I was hungry. 
I knew I wanted to be better than the under 17s that were hammering me the year before. Mm -hmm. And I just knew I wanted to be at the World Youth. So I just knew where I wanted to go. I just didn't know I was going to get there sort of thing. And um, I remember starting off that season of like a 10-7. Then the next race was like a 10-6. Then it was like a 10-5. Then it was a 10-4. Then it was a 10-3. And before you knew it, I had gone from 10-91 to 10-35 in the space of a season, which was like... Kind of unheard of. It's like <laughs> no one ain't really well, yeah. taken a whole, almost a sec, like half a, over half a second of their time. Yeah. In that season, and even when I looked at myself running, like at the World Youth, I was like, wow, like I'm. This is. I was just kind of like, I got to the final, and I was like, how did I get here? <laughs> I was, I was doing like young athletes leagues the other day. Now I'm in a world final. Yeah. And I feel like I'm about to win this thing, sort of thing. I was like, right, this is kind of mad. But um, did you win? <sighs> well. I came second. Okay. And we were around the same time as first place. So literally I missed out on gold by two thousandths of a second. So that would have been a really, that would have been a sick way to cap off that year to be fair with a gold. But I feel like if it was a win for me, do you like, know what I mean? But- um, You got the medal. Yeah, got the medal. So you got win. the medal, mm -hmm. you secured that. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you a question. What's worse, mm -hmm. coming joint first, essentially. <laughs> essentially joint essentially first, Essentially joint yeah. first. Yeah. Or finishing in fourth place? I think fourth place. Because at least you have some, at least at least you have a medal. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, at least you have a medal. Do you know what I mean? Like, if you even if you come third or second or whatever, you might not be happy with it, but it's documented in history. You've got a medal. You've got silverware to show for it, and you can always be better. But if yeah. you if you come fourth, it's like no one remember fourth place. No one remember fifth place, sixth place, seventh place, eighth place. Some people don't even remember second and third. They remember the champion. Yeah, do you get what I'm saying? So essentially you want to be as close to first place as possible. So for me to get joint first in a way, I was like, I was gassed because of where I was coming from. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I was coming from a point where it was like, my dad said to me, listen, you're quitting athletics because your GCSEs weren't that good and you need to focus. I want you to be, what do you say you want me to be? Like an engineer, a doctor, whatever these things, yeah. And like, he was like, listen, if you're not going to be the best at this, quit. Like, I'm not seeing you show me potential that you could be good. And I begged him. I said, listen, just give me one season. Give me mm -hmm. one year. Let me go to this college. Just give me one season. If I don't do what I need to do, look, you could take me, but I'll come back home and I can go. I went to go to Westminster Kingsway College, I think. Okay, cool. He's like, look, look, take me there. I'll do my A-levels, whatever. Just give me one season. And in that season, essentially, I, I changed my life for that point in that season. Yeah. And then from there, you know, he's never said to me, oh, don't do track, obviously he's been on site, but um, it was just, it was, it was, it meant a lot because of the, where I was coming from. Where I was coming from, it was like, it was really grind, I grinded that year. I've been grinding ever since, but that year was a grind. Like people don't know what we were doing that year, just to- so that pushed you. you know what I mean? That yeah, pushed you when you're coming from this to thing, like people, 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 there's so much that you can gain and admire from the grind and, and not being as privileged or as fortunate as someone else. Mm -hmm. Because the, the skills it gives you and the hunger it gives you is different from someone who's already been there or is expected to be there. Let's just say, yeah, I'm, I'm here, whatever. Like when you know, I've got no choice but to succeed at this yeah, or else I can't do this no more. It's different to knowing if I don't do it, I can always come back at Next year. Next year. Not saying that those people don't try hard, yeah, but I'm sorry, the person who's got the person who, who hasn't got anything at all is going to be hungrier than the guy who has it. It's yeah, the person, the person, person who has nothing to lose. The person who has nothing to lose, and I had nothing to lose that year. And probably, that was probably the only year I think I had nothing to lose. I guess I'm kind of moving back into that point now. I kind of, it's interesting. I feel like I'm kind of, I'm a senior, but I feel like I'm almost in my first year that I felt like when I was in my first year juniors, because I'm in a different world now. Yeah. Now I'm trying to break into the big leagues. And I kind of, kind of how I felt when I was trying to break into the big leagues as a, as a junior. So it still feels like a similar, it feels like similar settings. Just obviously the stakes are a lot higher and I'm a lot quicker now. Yeah. But it, it feels the same. So that period was a really good time for me, you know? So over that three year period mm. of being an under 20, yeah. what would you say your consistency was like? Cause mm. consistency is always, it's, it's something that kind of gets overlooked yeah. a lot in a lot of different things. Yeah. In terms of like your times. Yeah. Were they consistent the whole way through? Did you have the drop offs? Did you have the, oh, why did I run that time moment? Mm. And then you had the, oh, okay, yeah, I'm back on track. This is the thing, like, it's sick to run fast when you're young because I think you give yourself a platform to build off of for a senior. And the platform I mean is the financial security 
to do what you love without the pressure of having to do a job mm -hmm. or having to question your place in the sport. So obviously some people do it without contracts and financial support and they blow through seniors, but I think that route is harder. Yeah. Um, if you have an opportunity to be financially supported and to give you the opportunity to get the therapy, to get the coaching, to get, that's gonna help your chances, isn't it? So mm. I say that, but it's good. But the downside that came with it is, and I think this is the thing I see, and, and you know, I see so many juniors, yeah? And I talk like I'm old, I'm only 22, but I see yeah. so many juniors. And they remind me of myself, like, they've got the bravado, they've got the swagger, like, I'm here, yeah, around this time, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm looking at them thinking, bro, I did exactly what you did. And this is what people don't realize. You run a one-off time, an outlier time. Mm. Outlier, something that stands by itself. It's not, it's, yeah, you did it, but it's not really you in a way, yeah? yeah? People do that and they think, so from my, my, from in, in my case, I ran 10-16 at 18 years old. Mm -hmm. I think fifth fastest British junior of all time, behind some seriously good peop, um, sprinters who yeah. have gone on to achieve good things within British sprinting. And I think I was like full fastest in the world that year. So it was, a, it was a serious thing, right? Yeah, full fastest in the world is, at that age is- <laughs> At that age was pretty much. <laughs> That's mad. a lot to scream about. So, but I did that. But where I went wrong was that I thought I was a 10-16 man. Okay. I had never even run, I didn't even run 10-2 that year. I went from 10-30 to 10-16. Yeah. Like I was running 10 threes all year long. Mm -hmm. I went to, I went to Bedford and I went 10-16, bang. Now the problem was, and I think within myself and people around me, the narrative now became, well, you're a 10-1 man. So we're gonna run 10 next year. We're gonna run 9-9 next year. Yeah. You haven't even run 10-2 yet. You need to be consistent. Like what you're saying. Yeah. I wasn't consistent. I knew how to give you something special, yeah. but not on a regular basis. So I went into my third year as a junior with this expectation of I've got to win the European Championship. I've now got an Adidas contract where if I don't win it, then I'm going to get reduction. So I've got, got that to play with. Um, I'm the best in the age group by, by a long shot. Mm. Um, and I'm just looking at, I want to I wanna break the British junior record. I want to run 10-0. I want to I wanna run 9-9 because of a 10, 16 I ran on a good day, it was 1.9. It was a good yeah, day. That's, yeah? a, that's a, a good day. pretty much perfect race. Pretty much that's perfect race. <laughs> not normal, it's not really normal settings, really yeah. and truly, yeah? But, and, and, and the people around me made, um, made me believe that that was, that was the case. I ran 10, 2 all year long. I think my fastest time was 10, 22. Mm -hmm. And I was vexed. I won the European Championships. I came further to the British Senior Championship. I had a good year, I had a good year in terms of developing into a scene, I had a good year. I thought it was a good year because I was like, I didn't, didn't I didn't run, I didn't run faster than 10, 16. I'm yeah. a failure, what the hell? La, 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 la. And then that's, and then that quit up until probably last year, that created this false narrative that I should have been running sub 10 mm. when really I had to be a consistent 10, one man, 10, two man, 10, oh so man dead. first. I hadn't yeah. even been consistent then. How, what am I doing talking about these times when I'm not consistent yet? I see a lot of this happening with, the juniors, they run a one-off sick time in Bedford where everyone goes to run it. And then they think they're that guy. And then the next year you find that they can't reach those performances and then they leave their coach and then they do this and then they start blaming this. It's because of this, it's because of that. No, slow your roll. Humility, we need to be consistent. Mm. And that's where a lot of people go wrong. And that's where the infrastructure and everything in this country, it, it builds you up to believe that actually that, boom, I'm going here. Mm. And I'm not saying that I have aspirations, of course I have aspirations, but in moderation yeah. and take things one step at a time. So to answer your question, I guess, I was, I, for a junior, I think being 10 too consistent is still pretty good. But for me, because I'd had the outlier 10 one, I didn't appreciate really what a lot of what I done. did in my third year as a junior. I didn't really, like, I crossed the line in that final in Sweden and I wasn't even happy. Cause mm. I saw 10 three on the clock, I wasn't even happy. I was like, Phew. then I thought, Oh crap! I'm in the championships. Let me celebrate. And I was yeah. like, I was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But in my head, I was like, Fuck, man, I only run 10-0. And I became time driven, mm -hmm. and I used to measure myself off of times. So if I didn't run this time, I felt. And I did that for for so long, for so long, to the point where when I was doing good things, I couldn't even appreciate them because I thought I should be somewhere where I probably wasn't ready to be yeah. at yet. It was only when I moved to Steve, he sat down, and this is the word that no one likes to hear: your average. Cause that's the truth. Yeah. What is your top 10 average? And I, I think my average was like 10, 18. And he was like, you're a 10 and one man right now. I know, I know you don't want to hear that. I know you want to run these mad times, but you're a 10 one man right now. We need to work on getting your average down to 
10, 10 and under. That's when we could start talking about sub 10s. And when I started to realize the process of how I need to be consistent, yeah. I was like, right, I need to slow my roll a bit and take this a bit slower because although I ran fast four years ago, it's, it shows great indication that I can be a great as a senior, but it doesn't mean that I was gonna get the things I wanted there and then. And that's where I think probably held me back for um, many seasons after after that, to be honest. Okay, so that was 20, 20 so you'd have been- 14, I was 18. Yeah, yeah 18, so yeah. around that time. And then you would have had one last year. I had the last year after that, 2015. And then as a, as how a, was that? That year was that year was good. Like I won the European Junior Championship. So that was the European. That was the European. That's okay. the, so the year after was the European Junior Championship, 2015. Okay. In uh, cool. El Elka Sweden. I'm surprised I still not to say that name. When I first heard it, I was like, "Where are we going? Like, we're going to what next?" Can place. someone break this down for me because I can't read. Really... I just used to call it. I just used to call it Stuna. Like, I just say Stuna. Yeah, you just you find something in there that you <laughs> just, can say. Yeah, yeah, I know this word. Yeah. Okay, so you're now trying. You are officially a senior athlete. Mm -hmm. A lot of things have now been thrown out the window, mm -hmm. such as social life. In a way, yeah. In a way, How but I still kind of coming through because. As well, an athlete, we're mm. kind of made to believe that you don't have a social life. All you do is train. Mm -hmm. All you do is is you wake up, you eat good, you go to train, you come home, you eat good again, and you just repeat that same cycle. Yeah. How different is it now mm -hmm. as a senior compared mm -hmm. to when you was a junior? And please give us some enlightenment into what your diet is like now. Well, when I was a junior, I was reckless. To be honest, to be totally honest with you, like mm. I was, I was out here doing mad stuff, like going out all the time, partying and whatever. And I don't regret it because I was young. Like you need to enjoy your years. You sometimes, like you can't, you can't get old too soon. Yeah. Because when you get to your mid twenties, you're gonna be like, right, where's the, where's the time gone? Do you know what I mean? And and I think everything is about balance. I think lifestyle is subjective to the individual, because there's been years where I've been poor with my diet, gone out quite a lot, sleep late, blah, 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 run a certain time. In another year, been on it, sleeping, I'm anti, man them, I'm gonna see you next year. I'm not out, I'm at home, recovery, everything, same time, I run the same time. So what, what, what was the limiting factor? What was the defining factor in making me run fast? It might not have been the lifestyle, it might have been other things. Yeah. So now I'm older, and I'm getting faster, I'm realizing you need to rest because to be able to come back and do the session at the same intensity it needs to be done at, you need to rest. Whereas before, I could give you a six session on a Monday, it may not give you anything else till Friday. But now I can come in Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and give you the same level every time because my life has a bit better. In terms of nutrition, I'll be the last person to sit here and tell you, I have five grams of protein, I have five grams of veg. I I'm not on that because it's too, it makes things too complicated. Some yeah. people, if you're someone who puts on weight quickly or whatever, I get it, you gotta control that. But for yeah. me, I keep it simple. Have some protein, have some carbs, have some salad or veg, fruit as well. Have a balance of those things and make sure on my plate, I've always got, I'm always, one of those things has always been represented on my plate, yeah. that's it. I don't care how big or how small the portion is. My, my thing more so is, um, how frequently I'm eating. Okay. So for me, I find that when I don't eat frequently, I lack energy and I'm more tired and blah, blah, blah. So I try to eat five times a day. Okay. But not five meals a day. Yeah. So breakfast is gonna be my big meal. Yeah. A snack in between. It could be a cereal bar, it could be a rice cake, it could be anything, yeah? Yeah. That's my second one. My third one's lunch, snack again. Fifth one's dinner. And that's how I try to keep my routine because I, it's unrealistic for me to say, you know, I'm gonna have this much grams, I'm gonna do this because what if my day's hectic one day and I forget to do it? Oh, am I gonna, all of a sudden I'm not gonna run fast. That can't be my determinant nutrition. Yeah, and if it is my determinant, then clearly there's other things I'm not doing well, if that's my determinant to run fast. Cause so. I watched a documentary. I think it was a brief documentary on Tyson Gate. This was a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And like, he's one of the greatest sprinters ever to touch this planet. Yeah. But it just seemed like he almost didn't enjoy the sport because it was just so, planned out like yeah. he was like yeah monday i have chicken tuesday i have this and i was like that's way too disciplined for me i can't yeah. do that i can't be that guy i think with tyson gay i don't know him personally i had an opportunity to meet him in 2012 pre-olympics mm. but like from what i've seen i think what we all know of him 
I think he was probably unhappy because of a certain Jamaican <coughs> well, who kept I would, taking his shine. I would be too. Yeah, who kept taking his shine away. So maybe it might not have been nutrition because I, I can understand when you start to run anything really 980 faster, I feel like there's you've got to tighten everything up. Yeah. If you're going to do it without drugs, yeah, you need to be on point in everything. Every, every component of your setup needs to be world-class. Your scientist, your therapist, your coach, everything, your lifestyle, it's got to be so on point because what you're trying to do naturally is f***ing hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's not easy to, to run those times naturally. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I can understand him eating his chicken and that, but I think he's probably just unhappy because he was just getting, he was just getting tucked in by bolt all the time. I mean, time. Do you know when I mean? you're running nine, seven, one yeah. and you come second. That's mad. That's gotta be tough. That's mad. Cause that would have won every single thing before that competition. Actually Everything no, I wouldn't have won 2008, and, but still. And yeah, after. And after. Mad no, thing though. Minus 20, minus 20, 2012. 2012 and 2008, he would have won, won everything. He would have won. So, so mad. That has to be and tough. And that's, I guess that's the, where we could say, would you be that's upset if you came second? I get that. Yeah, that Because one, that was a madness. <laughs> that actually was a madness. I, I was a really big fan of Tyson Gay when I was younger. Like, Seriously? I, yeah, I used to root for him a lot. I really wanted him to beat Bolt. Like, I always think, I don't see the hype in Bolt, you know? Like, da, 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 da. I, I used to be that guy. I, used to, I really liked Tyson Gay. And then obviously when everything happened with him, I kind of wasn't really a fan as much. And I kind of leant towards Bolt a bit more. I wasn't a fan of Bolt until 2012. Mm, same, 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 same. 2008, and nine, because mm. I knew about him before, but he mm. was just, he was a kid. Yeah. Like, so it was kind of just, okay, cool. Yeah, this this kid's quite quick. Like mm. he's going to do bits. Yeah. But to see him just taking the absolute piss out of these athletes, <laughs> like <laughs> man's eased up at like 75, 80 meters, yeah. slapping his chest. I'm like, I can't watch this fool. I was watching that but, race the other day and because I've been, I was studying like some of his transition and whatnot. Yeah. Okay. And I said to myself, this guy actually eased off and ran 968. And I'm, and, I, and I'm training hard and I'm thinking, I know when I run, I'm like, like I'm, not I'm, not, I'm not running 96 right now, innit? Mm. Do you know what I mean? And I'm thinking, I'm pressing, I'm on the accelerator right now. Okay, right. this guy just eased off and ran 96. I said, that, like, bloody hell, like, that must have been a mad, like, what was he doing? <laughs> Like, what was he doing? Like, what was he doing? I just I think to myself, I was like, what was he doing to, to run that quick? I don't know. I actually don't know. So you mentioned like doctor and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. How often do you see us? Because I know some coaches, like they know everything about their athlete. Yeah. Absolutely everything. Like they almost become the doctor. <laughs> yeah, gotta have, frequent, a gotta have a balance with that type of stuff. How frequent do you see yours? And like, do you get the regular like, blood tests, see how you're feeling week to week and everything else. Is that something that you do or is that a bit too in depth? Yeah, for me, um, I usually just, like when we was, when I was at British Athletics, obviously we would have like blood tests and regular screenings or whatever to check everything's okay. Mm -hmm. But for me, like I was someone who used to see the doctor quite a lot because of niggles. Mm -hmm. So if I needed to get seen by the doctor, if my hamstring was playing up or whatever I needed to get done, I would always see the doctor. But I think this season just gone, I think I saw the doctor three times. Okay. Just because I'm, I was getting more robust, I was having less niggles and I'm understanding my body a lot more. So mm -hmm. I feel like uh, if it's part of your routine, see a doctor, but unless you're hurt, I don't think you need to see a doctor that much, to be honest, okay. personally. Cool. Do you know what I mean? Because then you, when you do something too much, you start to have a dependency on certain things. Yeah. And then what happens if it's not there? What are you gonna do? Like okay. you're, you're gonna you're gonna feel stuck. That's an interesting one because what I wanted to ask you is physio mm. before and after a session. Yeah, has that become something that you depend on mm. or you can deal without it? It's very interesting because I'm basically in the transition of um, um, working without it. Okay, because I I went to Texas um, to train with the A and M guys and Vince Anderson in November. Okay. And How they was don't. That? It was so sick. It was a. It was a really good trip. It was good to get insight into what it takes on their side to do what mm -hmm. they do. And Vince is a legend in the game. So working with him and and getting his insight, on what he thought of me as an athlete, and things he felt I needed to work on, it was big for me. And the definitely gave me um, a lot of good things to work on when I come back home. But they don't. They get therapy maybe like once a week. Okay. Uh, sometimes some of them can't even afford it. 
because they're not pros. Like they're yeah. pros, but they're not signed. So they can't yeah. afford therapy. They, they, they do their own manual therapy. So I went like a month training at a high level with yeah. no therapy. But okay. I had to present for the sessions every day because like you have to, innit? You have, it's tra- the show must go on. You still have to train. And I, want, I was kind of like, I wanted to impress him. I, want, I wanted to like, you know, I'm, I'm strong. I can, I can hack this. Yeah. So I'm at home stretching. I'm doing everything. And I learned so much about my body. Mm-hmm. And I learned... I learned and figured out how far I can push my body without therapy. And for me, I'll probably say I can go about six weeks without it and work well. That's really good. That's really good. And and I think it's good to create that because um, when you come to competitions, some not everyone can afford to take therapists to competitions. So mm-hmm. you need to work on yourself. And when you rely on therapy, I think sometimes it takes away from your session because if you're doing runs and you know a, therapy, uh, a therapist is right there waiting for you, waiting for you it's very easy to say, actually, this feels a bit niggly. Can I get a massage? That almost is breaking up the continuity of your session mm-hmm. and you might not get the best out of it. Whereas when I'm in Texas and something's feeling niggly, I'm like, well, pff, I've got to get on with it because yeah. there's no one there and the session must go on. So I think for me, when I was younger, I used to get therapy all the time. Mm-hmm. All the time. I feel like a lot of young Any little thing. Do it. I'm on the bed. Yeah. <laughs> I massage my arm. I'm on the bed <laughs> all the time. But that doesn't build character. That yeah. doesn't help you understand your body. And essentially, I don't think it, it helps you become independent. So it was something I thought was like, you know, if, I'm, if I really want to take this seriously and be in the circuit and, and travel across the world, I don't think I'm going to be able to afford to take, I'm, I don't think I'll be able to afford to take a therapist with me all the time. Yeah. Well, boy, I got to look after myself. So that was, so yeah, what I would say with therapy, I think people need to, I'm not saying people need to move away from it because it's subjective. Yeah. But you have to use therapy for what it's there for. If it's trackside therapy, let it be trackside therapy. Trackside therapy, really and truly, I don't think it should be more than five minutes. Mm-hmm. Really and truly, if it's trackside, it's an intervention yeah. to help your performance. It shouldn't be anything longer than five minutes, short and frequent. Mm-hmm. Or if you're gonna get a soft tissue massage or whatever, designate a day in a week to do so. But I think, yeah, getting it needlessly, I think especially in the winter, you break down the tissue that you want to be um, adapting. So. Yeah, I think I like therapy, but in moderation, I would say. So you appreciate it more now as opposed to hundred percent, hundred percent. I think I find it more effective now. Okay. Because I use it less. But if I if you do something every day, yeah. after a while, the effects of it won't be as potent. But because I because I don't do it as much, like I I'll probably get a session of therapy uh, once just once a week. Um, but after that session, I could feel the effect it's had on my body, and yeah. then I'm like, okay. Now I can pinpoint what I need. This worked, that didn't work. And it just helps me streamline my performance strategies a lot better. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Mm. So you said you went to Texas yeah. in November. Yeah. What was the purpose of that trip? Yeah. Because obviously you'd have had your outdoor season mm. rest. Mm-hmm. To go to Texas in November for me yeah. sounds strange because yeah. that's so early into your yeah. new training program. Mm-hmm. So what was the reasoning behind that? Well, for me, um, I remember going to Birmingham Diamond League last year after the Europeans. I was like, yep, you know, I'm going to lay something down here. You know, I'm vexed I didn't run in the championships. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to lay something down. Went there, 10.31. And I was like, I'm done out here. I was like, I'm done. Mm. I need to chill. I'm tired, whatever, whatever. And I sat with my coach and said, you know what? Like... I want to be sitting here next year. I know we've had our first year together and everything, but I'm not on sitting here next year wondering what if being vexed because I didn't achieve this. Like, we need to get, we need to get, we need to get it done next year on the real. We need to get it done. Got two years away from the Olympics. I know I've run 10 but I want, I need more. Mm. And um, he was just like, you know what? Maybe you should go out and see events. Like, um, go and get his expertise go and work with him. And I think he will give you the edge that you're looking for. And with the European Indoor Championships coming up, um, I, like we've got about uh, eight weeks yeah. from now to the European Championships. For me, I'm not trying to go there to participate. I want to go there and perform and perform convincingly. Okay. And I said, okay, what do I need to do to make those the chances of that happening as good as it can be? And I thought, you know what? Step out your comfort zone. Go to Texas, go and train with those guys because they train, they, it's similar programs, but the intensity is a lot different. Mm-hmm. They're more brutal in their approach. And I said, you know what? Go and have a shake up. You know, maybe it might change your outlook on things and give you that 
edge that you that you that you want. And I yeah. went out there purely just to learn, to help my technique get better, to just just get just 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 to even pick his brains. The guy is so knowledgeable and so passionate. And I remember when he was taking me back to the airport. It was about a two hour drive or something like that from um from College Station to Houston. Okay. And we were talking for so long and the things he was telling me, I was like, man, this guy is, this guy is serious, man. And yeah, I just wanted to go out there basically just to help improve myself as an athlete. Even if I didn't see the dividends of that, even this coming indoors, it's yeah. just knowledge that like I just want to learn about my sport. So, so it, was a, it was a good trip. After that two hour conversation and how long was you there for? Four weeks. Four weeks, okay. Yeah. So, hope, so you spent a month there. That's a pretty <laughs> a decent month, amount yeah. of time to, yeah. to spend with a different coach. Mm -hmm. Did you have that? Maybe I should maybe I should inquire about like moving out here to train. Did yeah. you have that, or was you still like, okay, I've got what I needed to mm. to kind of revamp myself? Yeah, but I I know that I can still do what I need to do in England. And this is the thing I'll say again: when people go and work with different coaches, uh, shortly after they leave their coach and they go with that coach, mm -hmm. I think the problem there is, yeah, okay, you went to the coach, it's all good, but know why you're doing something. Mm -hmm. So me and my coach strategized and we said, this guy's my mentor. I want you to, I, I feel comfortable with you going to work with him because we do a similar program. He's got my best interest and your best interest in, in, in his heart and in his mind. And I know he's going to help you get better. So the ego and the kind of like defense that my coach maybe might have had or other coaches do have when those things happen. Yeah. My coach didn't have that because he knew it was to help me get better. So yeah. even if I turn around and said, I want to leave, it's because I want to get better. It's yeah. not a personal thing. But we already knew what the plan was. And it was like, you're going to work with him and then you're going to come back to me. And I sucked my plan. But okay. I feel like a lot of people might have been like, wowed by the whole thing because the, fa the facilities is amazing. Yeah. The weather was sick. He was sick. So a lot of people probably would have thought, man, I'm, f this. I'm out of here. Like, <laughs> I'm going to go trade with my man. But for me, I know what my plan is. And I know mm -hmm. this is part of the bigger picture. Would, I would go back there and like check in with him, but mm -hmm. it, the trip served its purpose. Okay. And so it didn't make me want to think to when leave. When you went there, mm. was that paid for by you or by your funding? I, I covered that. I covered that trip. It was a personal investment I wanted to make in myself. And um, yeah, I covered that. So luckily, well, covered the flight. Um, I, and this is the thing with athletics, you never know what relationships you can make. Mm -hmm. um, just purely through Instagram, I spoke to one of the guys who were trained out there, Dion, Dion Lindor. He's okay, a tr yeah. um, Trinidad Tobago 400 meter athlete, run, I think around like 44 free, like he's a world class athlete. And I just reached out to him and said, Oh, bro, I'm trying to come back to Texas. Do you know, do you know anywhere I could stay or whatever? And he was like, Bro, come and stay with me. And I was like, Nah, he's like, like he didn't even charge me or whatever. And then I came, I stayed with him and some of the other quarter milers. And they were, I didn't know them, but mm. I never met them before. They were the coolest guys ever. Like, they're guys who, if I see them on the circuit, see them at championships, like they're my friends. Yeah. And it made my trip a lot easier. So yeah, when things like that happen, it's like, it's kind of like fate. It's like, yeah, I know I, I know I made the right decision to go and train yeah, out here speed, sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. So yeah, the trip was basically, I guess, organized and sourced by me in, in a way. Yeah. That's so nice. What have you like, got? To be able to for do real, that, to real. be able to do that <laughs> and really say to yourself, yeah. you know what? As well. I need to do this. This mm -hmm. isn't something that someone else is going to do for me. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. It's very hard. It's very rare that you see people that will do that mm -hmm. because they always think, oh, but if I do this, this might happen. You just kind of said, I need this. Yeah. No risk, no risk, no reward. That's what I say. People want people want to achieve things, but don't want to compromise or sacrifice things to get there. And I've been that person as well. I've kind of talked the talk and I, yeah, I want to be successful, but I'm still doing the same things, still having the same habits. I'm going to get the same results. So this year I kind of said to myself, you know what? I need to change, not change me, cause I'm me in it, but if I want to get different results, I need to do different things. And I think stepping out of my comfort zone and going somewhere, which I didn't know, I didn't know what it was going to present to me. Yeah. No therapy, I'm used to therapy all the time. I'm <laughs> like, whoa. But, you know, off the back of that trip, it developed my mindset and my body a lot. So I'm really happy I did it. What about the athletes in America? Yeah. Like Obviously, it's a bigger country, they've got mm -hmm. a bigger pool to pull athletes from. But 
I've, as, as I've heard, mm. it's a different atmosphere. Mm. Like, people don't go there just to, like, you know, train for this. Yeah. They have a system. They live it, yeah. They have something that they actually aim yeah. for. It's like the American football. Yeah. They play, they go through school. Yeah. That's their focus. Yeah. You know, it's different from here. Yeah. Well, unless you go to Love Bros mm-hmm. schools and college like you mm-hmm. did, yeah. But I was, I, I was that in joining them and doing what they do on a daily basis. It was cool. When I, and this is the thing. I, I, I think... Me going out there, it 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 just broke this stigma that we all have in Great Britain that Americans are just doing something mad different to us and they're way, way better than us and blah, blah, blah. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that shit because it's like, you can't compare the two. You just can't because we're a country where, like you said earlier, people join athletics when football or another sport doesn't work. Yeah. In America, you've got someone's dad getting them to start track from seven years old plus, coaching them on how to do high knees. It's a different kettle of fish. Yeah. You can't compare the two. You just can't. You will always lose that battle. You can't compare the two. I started track at 16. Yeah. And I'm going up against the man who's been doing track already for 10 years with with um, high school, with and their high school system is lit yeah. as well. It's yeah. not, it's not a joke thing. We don't have that. What's, our high, competition what's our high school equivalent? <laughs> oh, you look fast. Yeah, you can go do <laughs> this. Oh, you look kind you of look big. All right. You look all right, you can do that. Yeah, it's not, it's not, it's, we don't have the infrastructure to match American. This is the kind of conversation I had with Vince, like when I was talking about the two, and he was like, you know, it's hard to compare the two because our system is different. When we come out of the juniors, we go into the real world. When yeah. they come out of the juniors, They've got the NCs, which is probably which is the best at what it does, yeah. and it sh- and it has world class performances. Great, but in a way they're shielded from the reality of pro life, so yeah. they can have four years to make their mistakes, to have their f- ups, to have their ups and their and downs, then just- and then get ready for seniors. With us, we're making those f- ups right in front of the public, yeah. and then you get bashed. Oh, so and so hasn't come through. So and so fell off. So, but mate, what do you expect us to do? We're coming out of juniors into seniors, mate. Some people, some people, might, Mac, some people straight away. Like you got um, uh, Dina, it went straight away, bang. It just clicked for other people, like myself included, it's taken a bit longer. Yeah. But that's just what's gonna happen when you don't have the structure that nurtures you up until that point. So um, even if the, like, so we have the issue of kind of, when you leave, the, like you're good as a junior, but when you leave, you might struggle a bit or whatever. Now with them, they have the same struggle as us. It's just a bit different. Their struggle is that they're sick when they're young, but then when they come into pros, they, they fall off. Mm. because they, they're no longer in that setup that they were in before. And this is the thing that happens that people don't understand with the pros. When they go to, when they go to college, the setup they, they've got, the SNCs, the therapy on tap, the coaching, the, the, the campus, everything, education, and, it's, and I've been there, it's elite, like it's sick. You can't fail there, you can't fail there. Mm. If you fail there, then you're just, you're just an idiot. Like you're honestly just an idiot because it's, 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 it's designed for success, right? Mm-hmm. They, put, they pump millions into that stuff, so it's, it's designed for success. But when they leave the pros, they're not the priority of the college coach anymore. The college coach is paid to coach college athletes. Yeah. So the pro guys find themselves, some, a lot of them train by themselves, or they've got a little assistant coach with them that maybe not that good. Yeah. They, they're, they're, then the, the, the meticulousness of, of what they had in college is not the same. That's why they may have one year post or two years max post college and they're still all right because yeah. it's just, they're just carrying over what they had. And then they fall completely off and they gotta go work in Walmart. Do it's you, mad. That's the difference. So people 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 get onto people get onto Brits like you lot do that. But they've got their struggles too. The only difference is that in that time or that year post college, they might get a, a, a 10 mil plus contract because of the performances they've had. We're yeah. not gonna get that. That's probably the only positive that they have. But in both countries, we both have our struggles. So they still do the same training. They still bleed the same way we bleed. They, they're humans, just like us. But when you put an American on a pedestal because of performances you saw in Eugene, and Eugene is an outlier place in itself, because that, yeah. that, that place is just a madness. <laughs> yeah, when I, when I went there for the World Juniors and I saw it with my own two eyes, I said, this place is mad. Mm. It's, there's nothing, there's, <laughs> you're gonna compare Birmingham to it or Bedford. It's not the same. It's just not the same. So when you see man performing there, Mm. and you get this heart and then you think oh, my man's gone clear all oh, my days but then what happens when they come to the circuit and race and they go to Europe and everything what happens then it's like performances are very much normal like everyone else's yeah. and this is where it's like the two things kind of the two scenarios kind of meet in the pro world in Europe yeah. because you have the juniors 
we've been exposed to the pro world since we were like 18 plus. Mm -hmm. Although we might not see the rewards of it straight away, we've taken the lashings, you've taken the beatings, you've taken the lessons. And then when you get to your early 20s, okay, now I'm a contender because I've been learning and I've understood. But with them guys, it's like, they had a a crazy capacity of, of high level performance. When they're young, it might drop off, but then that's when the two kind of meet and then we kind of just see who's the best on the day sort so of thing do you think it's more noticeable over here yes because our talent pool isn't isn't as, as big. big so you're fo- you're gonna focus on a 16 year old because the 25 year old who's supposed to be doing these things isn't so yeah. you have to look to the younger and that's and that's why i said before we got on air like it's starting to change now because mm. the depth we're starting to get more depth now thankfully yeah, we've got- so we don't need although we still look at the juniors but we're not going to look at them to save us because we're yeah. already riding the wave right now like when you look at the guys like the top four guys in 100 uh, i'm the youngest out of the top four and i'm 22. yeah in previous and and i've run 1004 like in other years 10 one would have been the fastest and you had to look to the junior because the man them weren't, just weren't doing their thing yeah so we got everything goes through waves we had a little bit of a low for the past maybe 10 years plus or whatever now we're, we're gonna get back on yeah, the high you're gonna see someone get an olympic medal you're gonna see someone make an olympic fight you're, you're gonna see someone do a madness in the next few years because we're getting the depth and that's why it's not as noticeable now when you see juniors kind of not really doing their thing yeah because we're, we're focused on the on the seniors now yeah, because, because they're doing their thing i think now the teams are a lot younger as yes, well. Yes, like that's the thing. In the last few years, when you look at who's on the team, yeah. it's rare now that you're seeing Very rare. someone over the age of 30. Yeah, it's true. Like the main core of the team is made like the up average, of people The from, average in the relay team might even be like something like 24, the average. That's yeah. young. Like 24, 25, or, or same, maybe even 23. The average, is, the average is getting younger, which is showing that we are bridging the gap on the Americans, the Jamaicans and everything else. And I think it showed in the last World Championships, we had a Brit in the final in Reese. Mm. And it's it's gonna be it's gonna be more to come of that. Like me personally as a sprinter, I don't subscribe to this whole America's America like the yeah, I can't disrespect America. America have produced some of the best athletes of all time. Can't dispute that in it. As a sprinting nation, yeah, they have been better than us. I don't subscribe to to the narrative that they're, they're just going to be superior forever and that's that. No. Mm. No. Because well, Jamaica already proved that. Jamaica already proved that. Jamaica are going through their slump now as well. So yeah, it, now they're like, struggling. It happened. Now they're struggling. Like, yeah. it happens. And all this, all this, yeah, Americans are good. Yeah. But like, when you break it down, they've got their own struggles as well. So I hate it. I absolutely hate it. Yeah. I hate it when British coaches and people are like, you guys need to do what the Americans are doing. We need to do what the Jamaicans are doing. And you guys don't work enough. And you guys don't do this. And then, 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 then. Okay, cool. But you're going to now compare a boy who's come off the road and to do athletics and you want to chuck him into a program that man have been doing for 10 years, been injured doing that and hardly even survived. You, want, you think I'm going to survive? How am I going to survive? <laughs> there's a, when there's a man's a been there and been struggling, how am I going to survive? <laughs> there's a it? lot of coaches and... Um, it's just an ignorant the, way of thinking. For the sake of being political, I'm not going to name drop people mm-hmm. for today. But there are low, there's still coaches kicking about now that it's like, yeah, well, when I was an Olympic athlete. Exactly. This, okay, but Times that have was, changed. We have Mondo old, tracks. How many years ago? We have more spikes in our, tra- in our spikes. <laughs> Things like, have changed. How many athletes have you coached that have made it, but they've been hurt ever since? Exactly. Exactly. Now, you can only reference that one time that the person just about stuck their body together to perform. And that's what we want to use to reference for everyone else. And, and, and like I say, I'm not even trying to knock that way of working because people do get results that way. But I think the people who get results are those who have been in that system long enough. Mm-hmm. I had like um, in Berlin, I shared a room with um, Zano. He won, okay. he won 100, yeah? Yeah seen him in the build up and everything and to be fair even seeing him i, I kind of knew he was going to win before the competition started just from how i saw his demeanor and everything else so he did his thing a big shout out to him but um i remember talking to him and i was like right like so obviously you've been in jamaica like for god knows how long like do you really think that like a brick could go over there and and be able to hack that program and actually be successful in it? and he goes honestly I don't really think so because even me myself, although I'm running fast now, it's taken me about five years to adapt to this program. Mm. I've had mad hamstring injuries, foot injuries, knee injuries through trying to be in that program 
but it's taken my body time to adjust. And mm. now I adjusted, I'm seeing the results. But he okay. was like, just you coming in just off of what you've been doing as well for all these yeah. years to now do a madness. He goes, I don't know if it would work. And if you look historically, how many Brits have gone over to train in the Caribbean or America and have had really, really, like, oh, I'm not saying that no one ever has, but it's not a frequent thing. That just shows you that the culture, the lifestyle, the intensity, everything is just, it's different. You can't really expect someone to go over there and be able to just acclimatize to that program off the back and be able to be crazy successful. It's not impossible, but it is a hard thing to do. Like you said, it takes time. It takes time. Like, Have you got that time? Have man got that time? I really know, and truly. I know for sure. I ain't got that time. I'm 27. The Olympics, is in, the Olympics is in two years time. Have you got that time? This is the thing. So when, when coaches come out and, and bash athletes, oh, you guys don't train hard enough. And you, it's like, you don't know me. You don't know, you don't know me know for body. one. You don't know my body for one. You don't know my, my body history. And not only that, um, when you go into this on, onto the circuit and everything, and you see man from Great Britain dusting man out that you claim we we should be doing the what they are doing, but man are competing with them, mm. beating them more time sometimes. Um, doesn't that doesn't that um, validate what we're saying? In that no, we're doing our own thing and we're taking a bit longer maybe, but we'll start as a nation. Coaches are starting to get it right. Mm. People are getting motivation from seeing other coaches and. Since 2013, we've had a new person break 10 seconds every year. Mm. That should show you where we're going. Do you know what I mean? So I, d I do get a bit annoyed when I, when I, when I hear like all that stuff because it's like, mate, like, we're, not, we're, we're not from there. Yeah. A lot of the time, you just got to be from there. Like, to under, like, it's just a different lifestyle. It's a different upbringing. It's, just, it's not something that you could just decide in your 20s. Yeah, all right, I want to now do that. You can try it, but it might not work. Mm. It just might not work. And I think... Um, that's where I think we've had a new wave of young coaches coming through and I think they've started to have results and I think that's probably motivated the old coaches, older coaches to kind of refine how they work. Yeah. And I think it's just everyone's bounced off of each other and I think that's why we're starting to see the performances that we've been seeing. Like you've got Dino, who's the fastest in the world. Yeah. That should show you where British Britain Shout is going. Shout out to Dino. Yeah, for real. She's done a thing this year, so. It's God. <laughs> yeah, so it was good. So you know, she's 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 doing her thing, and I think um, British sprinting is is going the right in the right direction for sure. I got a question for you based mm. on meetings and stuff. As you're now top of your game, like yeah. you'll get like the Diamond League invites. Mm -hmm. Do you now kind of frown upon like the local meets, or do you still think they have their place? Because it's it's quite noticeable that a lot of top sprinters in the UK they won't necessarily turn up to a meet. They'll go looking for overseas. And it's like, well, you could turn up here and still run that time. Mm -hmm. You spend all that time going overseas mm -hmm. and get nowhere. Mm. So. Um, I still find value in local meets. Like like in three weeks time, I'm gonna open up in Lee Valley. And okay. the Southerns, like last year, I opened up at London, no games, Lee Valley. And for me, I like starting on home soil. There's something, mm -hmm. I don't know what it is, but I just like kind of starting in familiar grounds, have my coach with me. Yeah. And then once I put something on the board, then I like to go abroad. Um, but I think the main competition I guess you're talking about that has lost its place is probably the British leagues. Okay. Because a lot of people don't do it anymore. And I think the reason why, I don't think it's because people think they're too big for it or whatever. I think it's the time of year. Mm. Like they had one of them that was like the week of trials or the week before trials or the same week as like certain diamond leagues and certain yeah. London that like, man, we're not going to do those competitions. We don't get paid. And this is the thing. And, and another thing people don't realize as well is that in a lot of people's contracts, you're not going to get paid for going to certain meets. Yeah. As in, if I run 9-9 at the Valley, mm. unless, I, unless, I, unless I file a lawsuit against my brand yeah. like, and take it all the way, they're not going to pay me for running 9 out of Lee Valley because it's not an IAAF recognized meet. Mm. They want to see you at World Challenges and Diamond Leagues and Championships running times. Why? Because that's where the brand logo is going to get seen the most. Who's going to see an Adidas logo in Lee Valley or in Bedford? You're not going to yeah. see it. So, it's understandable. So they, that, that's, that's another thing as well. So, and I think that's part of being, I know we're in an amateur sport for the most part, but you want to be called a professional. Mm. You've got to race in professional places. So that's why I would say you don't see a lot of people going to those meets but you know for me anyway i can't speak on everyone else but for me 
you know, like even like my outdoor meets, I like to go to Loughborough International to start my season off because I love the vibe. I love catching up with people I haven't seen in ages. I like, I just like that. I like the, I like the hype as well. Like, yeah. I like being around people who I know and things like that. So for me, I, I think there's a place for it, probably in the early parts of the season, the same way other people would open up in America yeah. and whatever. For me, open up in the UK, it, it makes sense before you go out to Europe. So on a mental side, mm. Like you said, you like seeing people that you haven't seen for a while. Mm -hmm. Before a meet, yeah. what is like your process like in terms of warming up, mm -hmm. music? Mm -hmm. If you listen to music while mm -hmm. you're warming up, well, I know some people do, some people don't because yeah. they find it distracts them. Um, when you see someone that you know you're going to be running against in like the next 40 minutes, do you ever see them and they kind of run past? You think they're, they're looking quite quick today, but I'm going to smoke him. Um... For the most part, you know what the thing is with me, I'm a very chilled person. Like when I'm at mm. training, if you see me at training, like I'm very chilled, cracking jokes. Like, cause I find, again, off probably off my past experiences, I find being too intense and too serious, I don't get the best out of myself. Okay. So I'm not gonna say I'm, I'm mad chilled like a, like a bolt. That's a bit too much. Yeah. But for me, I don't like to take the pressure off myself. I like to treat it like a normal day because on a normal day, I can chill in training and talk and run very, very fast in training. So why would I now change that process on a race day? Okay. Obviously, I get a bit more serious. My arousal levels are a bit higher. Yeah. But for the most part, I like to stick to my processes. So yeah, on a race day, I just try to be calm and relaxed. And when I see other men who are hyped up and whatever, it just makes me laugh because I just yeah. think, nah, you don't need all of that. We don't need to do all that today. Okay. But probably say the one time last year where I remember being at trials. And I think that probably contributed to me probably not doing well. But like, I remember going to trials and like, I, I, I was watching everyone too much, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at, right, my man looks good today. Right, he looks good. Right. But I don't know what's going to happen today. You know, there's bare of us here. Like, whew, right, that, that, that. Before you know it, mm. I'm lost in the moment sort of thing. And then by the time I come out to race, head's gone. So yeah. on race day, I don't really like, I don't really watch no, I just watch myself. I listen to, I listen to, I don't listen to music when I train, mm. but I listen to music on race day just to block out the noise. Okay, yeah. And I like, listen, music gets me, like fast tempo music, a good instrumental that will get me that will get me hyped up. So for me, I'm just chilled. I don't like to overdo my warm ups. Like I'll just take it easy. Yeah. Cause a warm up really for me is just to raise your blood levels. Do you know what I mean? Just to get your blood and get your get your body hotter. Really yeah. true. I don't look at it as a place to run flat out and be moving mad and that. It's just to get me warmer and then I raise my levels closer and closer. And then when I get to the line to raise, I'm at my mm. highest point of intensity, of looseness, of everything else. And I'm just like a, like an incline in a way. Okay. So that's kind of how I look at my days, yeah. In your pre-race yeah. warm up, yeah. or time to raise your blood levels as you called it, mm -hmm. is there anything in particular that you would work on? Cause I know mm -hmm. like traditionally you see people maybe working on their starts, mm -hmm. they're doing a million and one um, yeah. build ups. <laughs> what's, what's your thing? Is it one or two build ups? Is it maybe just coming out of blocks? Um, so for me, I'll do like strides after my drills. I'll do some light strides mm -hmm. just to work on my rhythm. For me, it's a lot of rhythmical. Um, I'll do a few blocks after that 20. I don't feel like I need to go any further than that because I know yeah. what I'm doing the rest of it. And I feel yeah. like if I'm going too far. I'm burning myself out a bit too much. Mm -hmm. I think in the past I've done too much in warm up, And I've probably raced before I've even got out on the track. Yeah. I'm looking at other <laughs> men and just stride in. Yeah. But then when they come to the race, they've got mad energy. Mm -hmm. So I've been watching people over the years and I've started to clock the little tricks and things. I'm like, right, okay, he ain't doing that much because he's going to save himself. So I need to find a way of getting switched on without tiring myself. So I'll do like block starts to 20, maybe like two. Um, then in between maybe say a semi and a final or between round one and, and the final, whatever it is, I'll just do strides in my flats. I won't do much. And if I put my spikes on, I just, I sit in blocks. Yeah. Like I'll just get in the blocks and I'll just sit and then go into set and I'll come out and walk out. I just okay. have to familiarize myself with the feeling yeah. and then I go and race. Because by that point, it's say if we've got 45 minutes in between mm. or an hour, you're not changing nothing. Yeah. Nothing's gonna change. What you brought that day is what's here that day. All your job is to do is just keep yourself ticking over. Yeah. And trust that in the race, you, you'll you get it done. So I don't like to, I used to force it, but I don't like forcing Have it. Have you ever had that where you do something in warm up and it feels perfect and then you go on the line and it's like, oh, this leg doesn't feel like it's in the right position or I don't feel comfortable in the set position. I did that indoor trials this year. Like mm. I remember going in there 
as like one of the favourites, I think, to win. And um, I remember being a home warrior, and because I guess in hindsight, I look at it as insecurities um, mm -hmm. of not being sure if I was going to win. I was trying to do too much in a warm up. Mm -hmm. And I remember running, but I was I was winging, like, I was moving, but too much. Mm. I did a flying run, and I was moving so much to the point that I aggravated my calf in the warm up. So, and this is kind of like where, so that's like the beginning, and it kind of had a, the spiral effect ended up being in me full starting. Mm -hmm. But it started from over from wanting to overdo it. I was overdoing it. Then my calf started hurting. Then we get out there. I'm distracted now because of my calf. Mm -hmm. Then I get on the in the blocks. I don't feel comfortable because I'm thinking, I'm about to pull my calf, I'm about to pull my calf. Now I'm trying to get out to avoid pushing. Yeah. Then I full start. So I've seen the the, the consequences of, you know, f***ing up a warm up. Like, yeah. you've got to, oh, almost got cramped there. <laughs> <laughs> Come on now. I was like, yo. <laughs> can, can, can somebody get me a physio? We need Jesus some Christ. assistance inside here Jesus at the moment. Christ. Um, yeah, so um, yeah, I've learned my lessons of overdoing warm ups. Like, just gotta chill, man. Trust that it's there. Gotta trust it's there. That's literally it. Yeah, because um, like, I've started coaching myself okay, now, yeah. and like you do. Yeah. And my first experience as a coach in the national level, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of coaches that were coaching, mm. like they were literally just giving instructions yeah. constantly before the well, once compete, so mm. like an hour before the race. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know, wouldn't that put more pressure on you? You know, mm. I've ever had that before where you just think like, you know, I don't think I can handle this It's interesting now. because like, and it's a good point you said, because this is kind of part of the things I've had as old habits that I'm trying to like um, move away from now. And like, Really and truly, I think up until 24 hours before the race, you could do all the technical stuff you want. You could talk to your athlete, you could tell them this, you could tell them that, make sure you do this. But when it's 24 hours out from the race, a day before, we stop talking, me and my coach, we stop talking about the race. And it's in, I move into a place of being instinctive because that's what racing is. It's being instinctive. It's being, it's just like you're responding to what's around you and you're trying to compete and win. Yeah. You can't win whilst thinking. You can't win whilst thinking. Have you ever tried to run and think at the same time? You know how slow it is. <laughs> it doesn't work. So when you're running, you need to go into autopilot. And I think the job of the coach is to just be there for the athlete to have familiarity, to feel comfortable in their settings. Yeah. And that's, that's the job of the coach. Now, if they've done something in between the rounds, yeah, you can give them a few pointers, but even then, one or two things, it shouldn't be something to the point where an athlete feels like they've got an equation they need to solve. I remember like before racing, I'd have about 15 or 16 things I would tell myself. Honestly, I had written down, I had, okay, um, get into set with good pressure, then exit from the blocks with power, then work on the first step, then your transition and this and that. And I remember I showed my coach the, my book I had and he was like, are you mad? Like, do you know how much things you have here? How do you expect to, to, think to, all to do all those once. things correctly whilst mm. competing against another man who's trying to rip your head off <laughs> and win. Mm. Myth. It never worked to me. So now I literally just have about two things I tell myself. Push and step down. That's all I tell myself. And it works for me because it's I can I can have a technical part of my brain. I used to think about what I need to work on to, to do well in a race. And the mm. rest of it is instinctive and being a competitor and being kind of like you know, boyish in the way I'm trying to trying to perform. Like, yeah, I'm here to I'm here to do my thing, sort of thing. I have space now to allow that side from, of me to come out in a race, rather than this tactical, technical side that essentially makes me slower. Okay. So um, that's what I would say with that. Like all that talking stuff. Yeah, there's nothing you can. Say. The fate of your athletes decided when he probably woke up that day. Nothing yeah. you're gonna yeah. you're gonna change it. Yeah. However he woke up or she woke up coming into that day. day. That's what they're that's gonna, so gonna be you just like. with it. You can't change it then, it's too late. Before, you can try to, but even then, it even stands back to what you're doing in the winter. If you're consistently teaching your athlete a certain movement pattern, that's what they'll refer to on a race day. If you taught them the right thing, that's what they'll refer to. If they've learned the wrong thing and they've got bad habits, and you're under pressure, that's what they're gonna refer to. So I think the coaching is done when it's time to coach. When it's time to race, it's not time to coach. Because obviously that's what parents don't understand, yeah. and what your athletes as well, because yeah. some athletes will come and they'll say, oh, that coach is telling her to do this. Mm. It's all over her. 
why he's not doing that for me? And I was like, oh. you you already know this. You've got to move, <laughs> you know? you've got to move the you've, athletes into being in the, in the you've independent. You've worked towards yeah. this. There's no it's only them that's going to stand on the line. It's not going to be you. Yeah, you I'd, can coach them as much as you want. You can even walk them to the core room. But once they're in the core room, that's when the real stuff begins. Yeah, that's when I was the silent. Room, and onto the track. <laughs> it's just them. It's just them. So I think, one, sorry, one thing that my coach is teaching me quite a lot is to be independent, to not rely on him. Mm -hmm. and to go with my instinct and understand what I need to do to perform. That way, I'm in control of what I'm doing. And you learn better that way. And I learn well. better that way. So that's what I'm going to pass. I used to be very coach dependent. Like I would, I would wait hand on foot to get feedback from a coach. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, I realized the person with the answers is not the coach. I think the person with the answers is the athlete. And I think the coach basically gives the athlete the opportunity to realize that for themselves. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Because in a way, a coach, is, is giving you advice really and truly. You don't even have to listen. A yeah. coach is advising you really and truly. And I think mm -hmm. it's the athlete's job to process what the coach is telling them and, and figure out that equation themselves. Do you know what I mean? I think when it comes to the point where it's too coach-led, yeah. who's, who's, who's really at the forefront of this? It's the athlete. Do you know what I mean? And that's, yeah, that's, that's kind of how I see it. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you started making noise yeah. a few years ago. Yeah. Still making noise now. Yeah. Sponsorship comes knocking. Yeah. What was that transition like? Because <laughs> when that happens, it's like, oh my god, mm -hmm. I've I've actually made it. I've got someone who's willing to pay me to do what I to, love. To do what I love. Yeah. Represent them. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is do what I love. Mm. How did that change everything for you? Because now you ain't got to worry about where your next kit's coming from. Yeah, true, true, and true where potentially your next meal is coming True. from. Like, how did all of that stuff It was a big impact? blessing, to be honest with you. Like, like when I say, pe when I tell people, like, where I'm coming from, yeah, like, it was a grind. Like, obviously, my, like, my parents did what they could for me when I was growing up, but mm -hmm. I'm not a rich kid. I'm not coming yeah. from the hills or, you know, coming from a mad background. Like, I had to grind. Like, athletics for me wasn't a hobby. Athletics was like, this is going to be, I think, my way out. This is going to be my way to create something for myself because yeah I, i'd like to think i'm an intelligent guy but i'm not mm -hmm. the smartest person out there okay i knew that physically i was i was gifted mm -hmm. and god's given me an opportunity to do athletics this is going to be my way to make income this could be my way to kind of um put a message out there to inspire people and everything else yeah like so i looked at it like bro this is my way out and i, I remember having the same outfit to go to train and to the point where the, the black hoodies turn in silver. Like, <laughs> same trainers begging other people, yo, can you, are you got any spikes you're not using no more? Can I have the spikes? Mm. Like, I went world youths in spikes that someone else gave me. People don't even clock this. Like, like, I was coming from a mad place. So I remember when I first got, well, the first time I ever got offered a contract was after the world youths mm -hmm. and from um, Nike. But what, okay. it off, what it offered me was, it weren't. It Fair weren't. enough. It weren't worth me signing myself off for what I knew I was going to achieve the next year. So who are you sponsored I'm by? I'm sponsored currently? by Adidas and that right now. Okay, and that's, cool. that's, that's, that's who I've always been sponsored by. How long have you been with Adidas? Mm, going on my fourth year of them now. Fourth year? Yeah, I've gone okay, on my fourth year, cool. which, is, which has been a blessing to be fair. Um, but yeah, I remember like Adidas coming in. I remember this after I ran 10-1 and it was a very hectic time. And uh, I remember getting a deal. And I remember obviously when, I, when we finalized the deal and what I was getting signed for, I just remember going back home. Like, well, not home. I went to college and I was living with one of my boys and I was mm. like, yo, like, I just got this deal, you know. I was like, we lit, baby. We lit. <laughs> like, like, it was, like, it was sick. It was sick, so. Can you specify a few points of what Adidas has required from you? Okay. Um, well, it's just simple, really, Judy. Just wear our kit and, you know, if you're, if you're quit wearing other, other kit, then, you know. The contract's terminated. So is that is that actually a thing? <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so if I'm wearing Nike, like that's mad. Wait, so on a personal level, if you're like going if I'm to, out if you're and I'm wearing off-white Nike Prestos, I'm I'm in trouble. Seriously, one hundred percent. So you couldn't go to the shop in some night in just some N trainers nah. you've bought yourself. No, 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 no. Like either like for, well, this is the thing. Like. I know there's been situations of athletes I know before where they've worn, like they've been, say they've moved brands from somewhere else, but then mm -hmm. maybe, maybe let's say for argument's sake, they were waiting on kit from the new brand they signed to yeah. and they were still wearing the old kit or whatever. Yeah. I know cases where someone's taking a picture of them yeah. in that kit they shouldn't be in and, and sent it to someone in the brand. 
and basically snitched on them. And they've got in trouble. I didn't, they didn't get their contract taken off them. But people are spiteful out here is what I'm trying to say, in it? Like, people will go to that point. But for me, like, if a brand's paying you a load of money mm-hmm. to wear their clothes, wear their clothes. Like, it's not a problem. And it's free. But the only problem I had was that when I first, like, I, I, didn't, I didn't love um, Adidas per se when I first, like, I was always a Nike guy, yeah, every, everyone's, everyone was. everyone's always Nike. So when they, Adidas came in, it's just because of the money they offered, I was like, yeah. Man, I know I love Nike, but I gotta go where the bag is at right now. <laughs> yeah. So I went with them and I didn't really, I didn't know anything about the shoes. I just knew about like the Stan Smiths and that was all I knew really and truly. Yeah. So I was buying like foreign shoes. I was buying Valentinos or Gucci's or whatever. That's what I would wear. Mm. So if I'm not in Adidas, that's what I'd be in, isn't it? But okay. recently Adidas have been bringing out some fire. So I just found myself wearing Adidas and I, I don't mind wearing it. Mm. But um, yeah, like if you was to, if you was with a brand and then you wore another brand, you probably, maybe you're just probably trying to get at that deal. Like that's so, probably the only thing I can think of you doing that. <laughs> All right, so I've got a question here because British Athletics yeah. is sponsored by Nike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you're sponsored by Adidas. Yeah, so a lot of on problems. So on a world championship level, yeah. you've got two things because you've got your spikes that you could wear mm-hmm. or the spikes that they're providing you with. Oh no, that's how, fine. How do you kind of get away with that? Yeah, when it comes to spikes, that's fine. Like, um, Obviously, they can't tell you what spikes you can wear, whatever spikes you want, that's fine. Mm. But like, uh, obviously when you're at championships and the brand is okay with this, mm-hmm. you have to wear Nike because you're at a Team GB competition. Like, but it's, when it comes to like diamond leagues yeah. or not major championships, so like say we have a relay to run mm-hmm. at um, anniversary games, Adidas wouldn't want me to wear GB per se because it's like, what's well, not a major chance? Why are you wearing it? Yeah. And I'm getting stressed because I'm like, well, these guys tell me I've got to wear a national kit. And I'm like, well, if I don't run, then it might mess up my chances of running in the relay later on. But then if I do run, then Adidas might get vexed with me. So I'm like, you know what? I call my agent like, yo, I beg you deal with this because I can't be bothered. Okay. Like, it's not my job really to be bothered about that. I'm here to run. I shouldn't be worried about the, the well, logistics. Where, know, but there's been <laughs> the times at championships, like junior championships where I was wearing um, Adidas socks and I, got, I had to take them off because I was at a GB competition. Like, I had to take them off and wear Nike on. So some, they, they really do get on you because I think I think they get fined or something like that. Shit. Like GB do, like when okay. someone's not wearing Nike at championships, like they get, that's a serious, when there's a lot of money involved, it's serious. So you, yeah, you just gotta wear the brand really. But that's tough. I don't mind, I, I like the kit, so I don't mind. That, that's tough though, because mm. it puts you in a position where, like you said, you're, you're very having to deal with two different things. Yeah, very conflicting for sure. But at the moment, have you incurred any fines? No, 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 I'm a good boy, <laughs> man. I'm a good boy. Like. For me to get fined by the brand is pretty mad. Like, if I was to do that, that basically means I was just trying to get out of his deal. Yeah. Like, I was just trying to do something on purpose to make the brand let go of him because he wants to do something else. But even then, I I think like ruining relationships and just getting a bad reputation. There's no there's no need for that. So mm. I personally wouldn't do it. Like, I actually like Adidas clothes quite a lot. So yeah, yeah like <laughs> I'll be wearing Adidas original stuff all the time. So I don't mind really. So you're sponsored by Adidas. Yeah they effectively help with your training, yeah, 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 yeah. physio, sure, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. What's that exposure like? Because you could just be walking, bang, your face is there on a billboard <laughs> or something. Yeah. What's that What's that like? Like, have you been in the streets and someone said, oh my God, you're, you're OJ, like you run for Great Britain. Do you know what? Yeah, it's not even it, like, we got to remember what sport we're in. We're in athletics, isn't it? Yeah. Like, it's not really like that to the point where someone's going to say, yo, 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 like, unless, yeah you were doing something on a world stage consistently where mm-hmm. everyone was always seen on BBC or whatever and it was on the news and you was on social media outlets and your name was just ringing. Mm-hmm. Like, like I'm sure Dina probably gets stopped in the street or Mo, yeah. all them household names. But for me, I, I had the opportunity to be on an Adidas, um, like a big flipping, what did you call it? Like a big Post s- the thing. poster or whatever yeah. in like one of the stores. And I remember like people going there and like, taking pictures of it and sending it to me and stuff. And I was pretty sick. I remember they when they were done with it and I saw they sent it to my house. I mm. just had it in my room, so that was pretty lit. But um, yeah, like people, like, I've been stopped before. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually have, but like very, like, very random. Like at times where I thought I wouldn't be stopped, I've been stopped by people and been like, "Yo, like you do tracking it, like keep doing what you're doing, or whatever." But never really like, like i said the coverage and the exposure we get in our sport it's not really to the point where someone would stop you on the street and say yo i know you that's sick yeah. like our sport's not 
is that big to the point where that would happen. Like you can go in the underground. You like can go in the underground no and one, be fine. Right, like, yeah. No one's gonna know you. <laughs> know, like you know, know, you know them athletes, them athletes, but them athletes are like, no, I can't really go out when they get seen. <laughs> I'm thinking, bro, no one knows you. <laughs> but see, no one knows this, you. This is interesting because I look at track and field. I mean, I'm a massive fan. Yeah. So I've been watching it for a long time and yeah. I've got a lot of friends in track yeah. and field. But to me, you're just reg like you're just regular, regular people. people really but intrigued. obviously to other people, you're superstars. Okay, yeah, true, true, true. So but what I do get is a lot of young kids, and this mm -hmm. is what I this is what I do get a good sense of like satisfaction from. It's like when you see young people reaching out to you for advice mm -hmm. and saying, you know, you're my hero and you're my role model and things like that. Like I get Instagram messages all the time, and that does make me feel good because sometimes. You know, when you're performing and maybe it's not going well, mm -hmm. you're thinking, oh man, this, this ain't going well, whatever. But then when you get messages of that, you think, you know what? Although I'm not where I want to be yet, I'm still having the power to to have a positive impact on someone else's life. Yeah. And someone, you know, might have seen my story because I'm very vocal with my journey and where I've been. And if someone's looking at, at that and saying, right, you know what? I'm kind of in that position right now and he's managed to go to the Olympics and he's managed to become a good sprinter. I think I can do it too. Even if, if that's all that I did in track, mm -hmm. I think that I'd, I'd be pretty proud of that. Do you know what I mean? Like reaching people. I'm not really, I've always said to people as well, like I'm not trying to be famous. Mm -hmm. I don't want fame from track. I do track because I love it. And I want to get paid from track. <laughs> Let's be real. I want, I want to get paid. It's your job, so. I don't want to be, I get fame comes with it. I do get that, but mm -hmm. I'm not, you get certain athletes out there who, you know, they're doing the most for the gram and, it, and every time it's a chance they get, they want to be melodramatic about stuff just to get the clout and get the, and I, and you know what? Kudos to you, do your thing. But for me, I'm not, I'm not here for that. I'm here to run fast because I love the sport. I want to be the fastest mm -hmm. and whatever comes with that, obviously I'll take it. But like I said, I'm not trying to be famous. So if someone don't stop me on the street, like I, I feel indifferent. I don't really care to be honest. So just on a side, we said like being inspiration to people. Yeah that helps you get out of bed in the morning 100%. going through those tough 100%. times where training is not saying so mm -hmm. much and you start thinking, ah, oh, I'm not saying so much. Yeah, but the yeah. fact that someone's then reached out to you and said, oh, look, you're my role model and I hope you do really well. Yeah. That keeps you going. No, it fully does, man. Like I remember like in the summer when I wasn't really feeling that good, like around the times of Europeans and not getting selected and whatnot. And I was just down on myself. And I remember getting like messages from people like, yo, you've had a sick year this year, like da 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 da. And I just, loads of messages like that, oh, you're, you're inspiring me and all this stuff. Like it, it, it did, I'm not saying it fully got me out of that. Mm. Obviously I was still pissed, but um, yeah, like it was, it was encouraging for sure. Like when, or when people tell you, you know what, like, tell me, sorry. Um, you know what, I thought like, you know, you're, you're, you're up next man. Or, you know, I see you've got the potential to be better than these guys and whatever, whatever, they, whatever it is they say. Yeah. Like, it does, it is encouraging to hear, to hear from someone else. Because when you hear from people you know, it's like, you're just saying that. Yeah, you're my friend. You like me. Yeah, you of course you're going to tell me I could be the best. Yeah, you should If you didn't tell me I could be the best, I'm going to drop you out because you should be telling me that really and truly. But when someone random who doesn't need to tell me that mm -hmm. says it, I'm like, you know what? That does, maybe, maybe that's like, a, a, what's, uh, what's that? Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I can't remember the word I'm looking for. But, you know, it's encouraging. That's what we just say that. Because... Yeah. I like based on on the exposure side of things as well. Yeah. I remember you coming up, mm -hmm. and quite early on, it was like, "Oh, this kid could be the, the next Usain Bolt." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I remember hearing that quite mm -hmm. a few times, and for I, me, and, and I still can. I still can. For me, yeah. I'm like, "Yo, like that's good that you yeah. can that you can relate him to someone." But what's mm -hmm. that doing to him mm -hmm. as a person? Yeah. Like that's a lot of stress to yeah. put on someone because yeah, this guy's gone and done X amount of things in his career this kid's just starting out and you're putting all these expectations on him. Mm -hmm. How did you manage to deal with that? Well, I guess- Being, And you're still quite young as well, yeah. so- Well, I guess the know. answer to that is that I didn't deal with it. That's the, that's, that's the truth of it. Like, um, I think, cause my transition was so rapid mm -hmm. into being nothing to a bit of something. I think, yeah, it, it changed me, not for the worst, but like, I don't know, I felt, I think a lot of me got quite entitled. Mm -hmm. Not in an arrogant way, but in a, I should be on this level because I did this when I was this age. Yeah. But it didn't, it didn't mean, it didn't mean anything. Like, and I think when you have so many people telling you how great you are, telling you how great you're going to be, telling you you're going to run these times, even though really and truly, I, I can now say this, I didn't, I, the work I was doing them years, it weren't going to, it weren't going to validate the times that people were telling me I could run. Yeah. The way I'm working now, 
and the way I was working then, I had no business shouting the times I wanted to run when I was that age because I was I had a lot of maturing physically mm. and mentally to do. Okay. What, what business have I got shouting these times out? But when people are doing that, it makes you get a bit complacent, I think. It makes you feel as though it's gonna happen just a matter of when. And I think when you get into that mindset, you almost wait for that moment to come rather yeah. than getting after it and continue continually working on your craft and getting better. So for me, I guess you kind of have, when someone told you stuff like that, you kind of, I think you kind of have about two years to live up to that hype before people start saying, actually, yeah, he ain't it. Do you know what I mean? It's sometimes even less, yeah? yeah. And then when it kind of came to the point where people actually like, actually, maybe he wasn't what we thought. Well, people start treating you a bit differently. People start talking of you a bit ill. People, people who you're looking at thinking, you're not on my level. Mm. Then it's like, they're talking about you like, any any guy I'm like huh <laughs> when did we get here We're like when did we get here and then you start to see people go past you and run faster and get opportunities that you thought you were gonna have mm. that is difficult to deal with because unless you're mentally strong mm-hmm. being a good junior and then transitioning to being a good senior you won't make it if you're not mentally strong I wasn't strong and I think if I didn't make the move of coaches and I didn't change something I probably would have it would have been I think it would have been a wrap yeah. You know what I mean? Not a rapper as in like, I would have quit track, but I think I would have just become, don't want to say someone's name, but I think I would have become, you know, a has-been yeah. 100%. And the thing is that I know, I know how good I can be. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? No one should really know how good I can be more than me. But yeah. I think it kind of started from me having this over, this overconfident view of what I thought I was because yeah. of the results I was getting. I was just, Ooh. I was getting on track and just beating everyone. And then going from that to like, now you're losing confidence because you're not doing what you used to do when you were younger. That that tra- that tra- transition is is very tough. But you've definitely got the potential there, like you yeah, said. Yeah, yeah, depending sure. on how things go, mm-hmm. this season could be the best season. It, it could, could be. It could be. be another learning season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. I mean, from the time you've been able to creep into the sub ten, mm-hmm. you're already saying, right, I've done this now. Mm-hmm. My body knows what it feels like. Mm-hmm. I just need to go and do that. I just need to go and do that again, again. for sure. For so sure. It's already there. Like, mm-hmm. you've already done all the work. We know. I, I, and the thing is, I'm very grateful in the sense of what I classed as my failures or shortcomings, a lot of people would have classed as a fantastic year for themselves. Mm-hmm. So, when I was a junior winning the European Juniors, I looked at that as. I wish I went to Beijing. That's my man was like in Beijing. That's how over <laughs> yeah. I was too far. I was going too too far ahead. Mm-hmm. I should have just stayed in the present and and appreciated being young. I was trying to be too much too soon. Yeah, I was like I should have been in Beijing. Why am I not in Beijing? So when I, I'm, not, I'm in the room with the girls and I'm like I'm not even happy. I won. They're like what? You just won a European championship. <laughs> how are you not happy? I'm like man, I wanted more. Mm. And and then okay, going to the Olympics was sick because that was something I did not think I, that was gonna happen for me. But then 2017 winning the European Junior Championships, I weren't happy because I was, for me, I didn't look at it as a good year because I didn't go to London. Yeah. I was like, man, I've already improved 400s. I should have run, I should have run faster. Like, but those, but all of those things I'm naming, or even this season, running turn but then maybe I came up short, but some people would have said, this is an amazing year for me. I looked yeah. at that as, no, because I know where, what I can do. I know the potential I've shown when I was young and I know what I can come. And I think people who know me know what I can do. Mm-hmm. People who, if you're smart, you wouldn't. You if you're smart, you wouldn't. You wouldn't write me off if you're smart. Yeah. Because I think if you you write me off, then okay, that's fine. But I think if you're smart, you wouldn't because you can see the potential there. I think I've just had a lot of missed kind of opportunities and mm-hmm. come up short in a few occasions, or maybe I oh, messed up here, fucked up here. Okay, cool, whatever. But eventually, I'm gonna get it right, and when yeah. I get it right, it's gonna be big. So. Yeah, I think yeah, for, yeah. For me, I kind of just yeah, just like take I'm, it in my stride. Like I said, you've already gone. Sub ten, yeah. I, yeah. Albeit, albeit, I, for, I, I even forgot about that. Will be a win. A win. Time, been, yeah. At least windy. it's up on power of ten. Of, now. You know what? Yeah, it's something I can say in my life. I've done it. You've done it. Um, and for me, and that's good. Yeah, it's, that's it's great. Good. It's like, good. Any, I, any was person. Like, it was mad. Was it like, you know, when you finished running with it? Was it like, oh, I don't know, was I? Well, when I actually <laughs> I finished the race, when I finished the race, there wasn't the clock. The clock was um, stopping slower. Okay. Uh, so right. when I ran, it stopped at 10-1 okay. initially. But for me, I thought, 10-1 for open, I still calm. Then the results came up and I saw 9.99 and a 
for the first round and I was like, right. really tough, it? <laughs> I saw four points off and five points off and whatever it was. And I was like, I didn't even care about the win. I said, I, I just ran under 10 seconds. Mm. I was like, nah. I was gassed, too gassed. Because the second round I got my ass beat. In the second round, I was too excited. Because I probably, I think I could probably go to run nine eight in the second round. Because I got I got left in the blocks in the final because I was too, you know when you, when you get over excited, you're thinking next round is going to be a breeze. Mm. I switched off. And I got yeah, left. off there, you're like, okay, I can do this I can now. Do, I can do this now, I'm yeah. gonna do this. My head just went everywhere. So I should have calmed down mm-hmm. and been less and been a bit less excited. But it probably could have been a 9-8, which was, it got away from me, but it is what it is. But um, that was fun. And obviously going with 9 9 I think I was, they said I was the the second Britain history behind Linford in all conditions to run sub 10 twice in a day or something like that, which is like- Again, that's a which is Which is, which is, which is, yeah. which is a good achievement in itself. Like, um, which is good, but for for me, all these little things like running sub ten windy and these stats, they're all secondary. For me, I want to be number one. I want to run sub ten legally. I want to, do you know what I mean? I want, I want to, I want to step up and get do medals. it properly. Get the medals. Like everything else to me is just, it's just showing me um, these. This is just um, indicators of things to come. That's how I look at it. I look at everything that's happening right now. It's just indications of something to come in the future. So, so. I'm guessing you're. Main target for now will be 2020. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the main. Target. Although we're in 2019 and we've got the world championships to negotiate, my mind is in 2019 and 2020 in a sense that I do want to perform well this year, mm-hmm. but like it's a platform for next year. So the first thing I need to start doing is making an individual in the hundred meters. That's something yeah. I failed to do. I haven't done that yet. Okay? okay, we can't talk about Olympic final if you can't do that. Do that first. Run under 10 seconds. You're mm-hmm. not going to make the Olympic final if you can't run under 10 seconds. Mm-hmm. Run under 10 seconds. You know what I mean? Win a British Championships, medal at British, top two in a British Championship. Start to get into the habit of doing those things regularly. That's what I'm going to use 2019 for. It's a platform. And then next year, I can sit with my coach and say, I wanted to make an Olympic final. And it's not going to be a thing where oh, this guy's shit, man, like, shut up. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to be that. It's going to be actually, okay, how are we going how, 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 how to get this done? That's, that's what I'm about right now. So um, yeah, 2020 is the big goal. Um, and I honestly couldn't care. In a way, I, I say I don't care, of course I care, but whatever happens um, up until that point is secondary. As long as I, as long as long it teaches me the lessons and everything else to get to the point where I can make an Olympic final, yeah, that's all I care about. And even if I get to Tokyo and I, and I come up short, then guess what? In Eugene year after that, I'll make a final there. Like, what, what, the, what these years have taught me is that, listen, okay, I might have come up short, but you know, I, I, it might be delayed, but it's not going to be denied for me. That's how I look at it. Like, I'm going to get it at some point. It's a good way you know to I mean? I'm going to get it at some point. You're only 22. <laughs> I know. So, I know I'm talking like I'm 30. So, but you've I've got yeah, I've got time. I've still got time. I've you've got, got time. at least, what, two two more Olympics? Two more cycles. Yeah, potentially. Oh, two and more I'm cycles. talking after Tokyo. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You've yeah, for yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Got, yeah. What, three or four world championships, yeah, European championships? Mm-hmm. You've got so much. I've got so much to look forward to. You're right. You're right. It's, it's crazy to think that you're so mature at 22 yeah. and you've got all these plans and it's like someone would think, oh, this is like an older guy. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, is, this is a young man who has a long time to achieve what he wants. But, but a lot of people tell me that. They just say, listen, you're like, you're, like you need to be, just, just enjoy being young. But I think where I've immersed myself so much in track, like I've just kind of just been thinking uh, beyond my years in a way. So sometimes I've got to bring myself back down and say, listen, you're 22 relax but I guess it's hard to say I'm 22 when in the same breath mm. there's other people who are 22 who are running 9-7 running 9-8 running 9-9 winning this champs and that so I never try to use that as an excuse mm-hmm. to kind of uh, as a well, cushion to fall on and say but I'm only 22 yeah but the next guy's even 21 even 20 so I, <laughs> so you know, I, I never like to use age as a as a as a as like a cushion to say oh no I've got time I know I've got time mm. but in the same breath you can sometimes sometimes that can be negative as well because when you keep saying I've got time I've got time I've got time then the moment never always, comes always, you create it just the moment gets a bit further away it gets a bit further away that. like the moment is not the, there's no such thing as the moment you create it it yeah. doesn't just happen so in saying I'm young you're waiting for the it's moment when you're older yeah. yeah for all you know you could that moment could be now and I and I've seen a lot of people just grasp the moment there and then and they've catapulted themselves into into stardom and into a world class field and I look at it and I say you know what there's no point waiting the time is now if you're ready now do it now yeah because you don't know what it could be next year can't be afraid to pull the trigger you can't be afraid and the best sprinters 
you watch them in a race, they know when to pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. You see them, if it's either at the start, it's at the end, it's in the middle, they know when to pull the trigger and they don't hesitate with it. And that's another that's another conversation, but. When is you yours? <laughs> I'm trying to make it be the, be the whole thing, to be honest, but you know, I guess I've been known for the trigger being at the end. Mm -hmm. But I think the way my, like my techniques changed a lot this year, even okay. in training, like I've just been developing everything even more. Like I said, I've been in my second season of my coach, I'm just improving a lot more. And I feel like right now, the trigger is probably, like, I guess in the middle point in the race, but it could be at the start, it could be at the end, it could be in the middle, it could be anywhere. I'm trying to get myself to the point where yeah, I'm a, I want to be a complete sprinter, have a start, have a finish, have a middle. I don't want to be someone who just has a finish or just has a start because yeah. essentially you have a limiting factor, which is the opposite end of the race. I want to be someone who's got, you know, a, a, a good race across the board. Okay. Yeah. Um, I look forward to seeing. Yeah, you're gonna. See, you guys will see it soon. In anyway, a few so weeks we'll and in a few and weeks. in a few months, I look yeah, forward to seeing it. 100%. So, on a lighter note, like outside of track, yeah. What do you do? <laughs> what What do you get up to? I do, for the most part, I'm chilling. If I'm not with If I'm not with the misses, I'm mm -hmm. chilling. If I'm not with her, if I'm not training, then I'm at my mum's or I'm with my friends. Cause I, because I'm because I'm always training full time and like my friends are working. I don't always get to see them a lot, but when okay. I can, we we'll always link up, go do something, go out, go eat or whatever. So I'm quite a social person in that sense, I'll say. And if I'm not doing that, I'm just at home banging out a FIFA. FIFA. Or, um, I'm quite into I'm into videography quite a lot. Okay, yeah. So um, I'm trying to take that a bit more seriously in 2019. I feel like I kind of just want to get this I kind of I don't know when I'm waiting like I said like I said earlier there's no such thing as the perfect moment but yeah you know I'm trying to I'm trying to fit that in at some point and um, I really want to start working on that like I said soon. earlier it's a balance it doesn't have to be 50 50 yeah. it could be 60 40 for or sure. 70 30 for sure so for sure. once you've got that balance yeah you're right everything's gonna fall into place nice nah, true but yeah I've, uh, yeah outside of the track I just try to it doesn't really matter what I'm doing as long as I'm having time to switch off from the intensity yeah of training I could be doing anything, you know? So that's something I've learned over the years, just knowing where to switch off. Is there any like guilty pleasures, like t TV programs that you indulge in or <laughs> foods that you kind of say, I shouldn't have this today, but no, I'm to be fair, with, anyway. with TV programs, to be fair, I watch, I watch anything. So I won't really have got any like, um, like bad shows I watch or anything like that. But um, when it comes to food, yeah, okay. This is the first time I'm saying this. Mm -hmm. So you guys are getting exclusive, yeah? There's a, there's a dessert place um, near mine, yeah, called mm -hmm. um, Cakes and Shakes. Cakes and Shakes, yeah. I know it quite well. <laughs> I, I, I know it maybe a bit too well. And it's on Uber Eats, yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, like sometimes after I've had dinner and I'm just chilling, I'll just go on the app and I'll get a chocolate cake and custard and I just eat Heat it. up I a little bit. And sometimes I get too, like, I'm even a bit mad, but so that's my guilty pleasure. Sometimes I just have a chocolate cake when I know I shouldn't be, but you know, yeah, healthy diet and all that. But um, yeah, that's my guilty pleasure. So, so do you kind of like tweak your your missus into getting that as well? She I'll be like, more... I'll be like, to her, listen, like you've worked hard this week, like you deserve some cake. <laughs> and then she'll be like, you know what, I do. And I'll be like, yeah, I'm gonna just get two. And then she'll be like, alright, cause so we we yeah, sometimes we sometimes we got battles with that. But like I said, like you can't you can't be in you can't eat healthy f like all the time. Like sometimes yeah. you got like sometimes in a weekend, yeah, you can afford to have a little cheat meal, like. That's more realistic to me. I want to mm -hmm. come on this platform and start telling you guys, listen, make sure you eat healthy, guys. You know, health is wealth. I get it. It is health. Yeah, cool. But mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and tell you something that I, I don't actually do daily. Like, sometimes I eat cake, innit? Like, yeah. It happens. Sometimes I eat cake. That like, is what it is. It is what it is. So, like, with your friends and social life, um, you said that you don't get to see them as much. Yeah. Do you end up seeing, like, the friends on the circuit a lot more? Or Yeah. Like, especially in my old group anyway, like, because I was around them like every day, mm -hmm. they ended up becoming like my close friends because that's the people who I was going on training camps with, who mm -hmm. I'm with. And the thing is that like, when you're, especially with sport, but track as well, like the, the people that you're with in training, you're probably with them the most out of everyone because yeah. you probably see them more than you see your actual family. So they sometimes end up becoming your close friends that like, if you guys get along. So in my old group, like we ended up just being, being a whole, big group anyway just because mm -hmm. we trained with each other all the time and we had the same things in common so we just ended up becoming close anyway so yeah. more time yeah I'd probably um I'd probably be around um them guys more but I guess as I've gotten older I kind of just enjoy my own company a lot more now as well I'm kind of learning to just 
just chill by myself and yeah. just like be cool with that. Do you know okay. what I mean? So, um, well, like you said, you got FIFA there. So just FIFA. I go online, Ultimate Team, and that's just me. I like I can't play PlayStation <laughs> and have someone there talking. Yeah, it's to mad, me. It's I, mad. I can't do it. I have to be alone to the, do this. The craziest <laughs> thing is every time I'm playing FIFA and I'm texting my girl on the phone to her, she knows when I'm playing FIFA. Because the replies become too. very <laughs> basic. The words are not spelled correctly. Okay. I'm typing it very quick. Okay. <laughs> Putting okay, I in that. Like, I'm not spelling it correctly and all that. So she knows. She'll be like, you're on FIFA, innit? I'm like, no, no, no. She's like, yeah, you are. So I'm not good at multitasking them two things yeah. at all. Literally. I'm, I'm not a good multitasker at, at all. all. I can't say that I yeah, can slow. do these things That's long. confidently. Something just has to get put to the side. And it's yeah, generally it's the more important thing. I'm, like, <laughs> all right, I'm going to put that there for now. Because this is what's important right yeah, now. for real, you're right. Now you're right. So, oh. like, we, we've seen your video. Like yeah. Like people said, was it last week? Or, like, earlier this week? Which video are you talking the, about? The vlog. Okay. The style of vlog. Okay. Yeah, and like I said, that was quite good. Yeah. <laughs> and is that something you've lent yourself? Or was it just through, like, school? You just kind of, like, people busy with? People ask me this all the time on Instagram. Yo, like, what software are you using for your videos? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, I use my phone. Like I play around with apps and obviously I take inspiration from maybe seeing other people who I'm into or musicians, music videos or whatever. And I get a vibe for what I like and I just try to recreate it my own way. Yeah. So like, um, now, like I said, now I'm trying to take it a bit seriously. Like I want, I got myself a MacBook in the summer. I got myself my cam a couple cameras and I'm trying to like um, take it a bit more seriously. But honestly, I just use my, my phone. Like people be surprised like what I can make with the most <laughs> basic of footage. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, so that, I guess with my Instagram, I just, I try to be a bit different. Like for me, I'm trying to create a balance between like, yeah, I'm a professional sports person, but the culture I'm coming from and what I've grew up on, that's what I'm going to show you in how I portray myself in the sport I'm in. So, you know, I'm not going to be the person who's giving you the clean cut videos and mm -hmm. got my got my media voice on like that's just not really gonna be me all the time like and on my instagram that's my platform i guess to show me yeah do you know what i mean like, i feel like these days people get will get to know your social media media before they even see you in person anyway yeah so um every chance i get i try to plug myself the way i'd want to be represented and that's so, it so um what's a friendship like with the rest of the guys you compete with yeah. for a place in, <laughs> in the championships and it's all right um i think like eric will keep saying everything is about balance and i think that's something that i've had to figure out as time's gone on how do you have a balance between being friends with people but understanding when it's time to go you're going to chop a man up when it's time to race yeah. that's the difference that mm. i don't think i really had because because I'm so cool with everyone and friendly, mm -hmm. when it came to race day, I'm still being friendly with everyone, but they're in the mode of, they're in killer yeah. mode. Yeah. And I'm still there like, yo, what's going on, uh, bro? <laughs> and they're like, I'm gonna chop off your neck. And they're like, I'm gonna chop off your neck today. <laughs> and I'm just there chilling, like happy go lucky and coming up short. So mm -hmm. I guess as time's gone on, I'm trying to get a balance between, um, you know, being cool with people, but understanding when it's race day, I don't know you and I want I want to be better than you today. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But for me, like I said, I think that way when it comes to race day, but on a regular basis, I'm cool. Like mm -hmm. I'm not, although yeah, I guess the elephant in the room is, yeah, we do have to compete against each other. Yeah, someone's gonna miss out, we get it. But I don't, personally for me, I know other athletes do that and some people are, are tasteful, some people are distasteful in how they do it, but for me, I know how to separate the two. If I see you at the track, if I see you at an event, I'm gonna show you love yeah, and treat you how I want you to treat me. But when it comes to race day, you know, for sure it's, it's go time. And I, I guess that's something I've yeah, tried to learn over time. Okay, that yeah. sounds good. Um, so on a bit more serious note now, yeah. what do you think the sport could do differently to mm -hmm. push themselves? And what do you think that the IAAF does well mm -hmm for the sport because that's yeah. basically the be all and end all of yeah. athletics that's the well, main thing for me i think i would say like the best way to say it is if i talk about other sports as well mm -hmm. because i don't want to bash athletics and say we don't do anything because you know, there are good points to it and this is what i love look at basketball look at 
um, American football, look at tennis, look at boxing, look at UFC, this goes on. Look at how those sports are marketed. Mm -hmm. And ask yourself what athletics um, doesn't have that those sports have. We've got different events, we've got different personalities, different body shapes, different ethnicities. So many things that you could delve into yeah. to push and promote an event to draw public attention. Mm -hmm. In boxing, you've only got two people fighting. In the grand scheme of things, how entertaining is that as opposed to like free out, a three hour event of so much going on, yeah. intense competition, blah, blah, blah. But that gets pushed well because of how, how they market it. Yeah. And, and I think the thing is, it's like, I know people talk about, oh, but because I talked to, to so many people about this. I talked to people within the BBC, within different um, outlets with influence and power. And it's all, and the things I hear back is, oh, it's the budget and, you know, but people don't have the money for this and blah, blah, blah. But it doesn't have to be about money. Mm. Because look at the Bleacher Report. Like, okay, yeah, they might be sponsored now, but I'm sure they had to start from somewhere. And that, and that, that outlet sheds light in the best way on the NBA, on boxing, all sport, on everything, yeah? Sick. Yeah. Um, Flow Track are, are, are doing a decent job in athletics, but I feel like because it's something that's kind of predominantly American, it mm -hmm. can only really benefit that side yeah. of the world yeah. in a way. But like, we need to use our outlets and make it more fun, make it tasteful. Mm -hmm. I know the people that come out to um, our events are usually middle-aged people, but what happens when those middle-aged people become elderly people? Yeah. Like, wh where's gonna, where's the point gonna come where we shift um, the focus on who we're trying to attract? Mm -hmm. Young people. And I feel like if we're attracting things in a cool way, the engagement in sport is gonna go up crazily. It has to. Because I know when I watch some of these things on Instagram and see it on TV, sometimes I'm thinking, you know what? I wanna try a thing in the UFC. I know I'm gonna get my head knocked off. <laughs> but I'm thinking I wanna try it because this yeah. looks fun. Look at how they promoted it. Look at the trash talk. Like. When we have press conferences, it's the press conferences with the same athletes all the time. And I'm not gonna say they don't deserve it. Of course they deserve it because they're sick. And I know yeah. if I'm in that position, well, I wanna have the press conference, but spice it up a bit. Um, have a press conference. Okay, if you're gonna have the women's 10K, mm. which I don't know if anyone watches, like people watch it, but like yeah. sometimes it's people's toilet breaks as well. Let's be real, yeah? I mean, I only watch it depending on who's running. Or you might watch it if like, Mo was in it or if someone yeah, wanted to see was laps. in it. Yeah, last two laps. Yeah, yeah. Last two laps. Go, 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 yeah. Go. yeah, oh, last like, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you're not gonna watch it. A lot, lot of people are gonna watch it from start to finish. It's like half yeah. an hour or something like yeah, that, yeah? Yeah, yeah? All right, cool. Now imagine if in a press conference before you had the world number one or the top two people come into the event you had a press conference with them both there at the same time mm -hmm. and asking questions that were like, that would provoke an interesting response. And I, and I spoke to some of the guys at British Athletics like a, a couple of times about this as well. If we've got trials coming up, if everyone's, if everyone's okay with it, mm. bring everyone to have a press conference and ask them questions that I guess would force the other man to say something that would now say, oh, I can't wait to see this race. That would be amazing because- We don't do that. For one, if you're if you've got everyone around the table and then you turn and say, all right, who's so, the best here? So who's the best here? Or <sighs> well, your head to head with this person stands yeah. at five to one. Exactly. Like but that's what we need. We need that to make it more exciting for the public. And nine times out of ten, we don't even actually get to see You don't get to see the, all the, the, uh, the um post race stuff. We don't get to see none of that. Unless the person won. You don't get to hear from the other seven who might have something interesting yeah. to say. Nice. Oh, uh, you, you didn't quite make it move to the it, side. And all we get, and this is the thing I always say all the time, all we get is a is a is a compilation of maybe like thirty seconds of your face being on the T V screen. Yeah. In that thirty seconds, you're now trying to work on your outreach to your fans, mm -hmm. get new engagement, all these other things, build your social media platform, build your brand with 30 seconds on a screen and in, in that 30 seconds you're not the main shot your yeah. head is there or your ear <laughs> or your elbow how's a man gonna see that and then say yeah I'm a fan of this guy's elbow <laughs> not gonna work like that so we need to have and, and this is the thing I say with um, the Bleacher Report and the other there's another account that I've seen or, or the Football Council 433 or whatever all yeah. the other accounts yeah, yeah. like they cover people before they blow as well. Like mm. they will cover the upcoming 14, 15, 16 year old, 17 yeah. year old. So when they make it to the NBA and high, they're like the high school. But that's why we know about everyone. Nice we know about yeah. everyone yeah. because you've nice seen them when they, when they were 17, you've seen their um, highlight rolls. And that's what I was saying before. Like I'm such a big fan of the Athletics Productions because mm. they will cover the montages on people. So it's documented. If someone wants to do their research on you, 
they will see yeah. Yeah. your race and they know what you're about. And I think in athletics, we don't have that. All it is is, yeah, tickets on sale now. Yeah, or come and watch so and so run. Yeah, that's it. And it's literally. And the they, same we're not person. selling up. You go to trials and you look at the stadium. It's bloody empty. And you trained for 40 plus weeks, working your ass off, blood, sweat, and tears. You're going to a stadium and it's not even full. And I'm not saying that there's a, I'm sure your motivation shouldn't just be the crowd. It's not my motivation. But there's a big difference between going to a stadium and watching and seeing it be patching, even seeing people moving around, not even concentrating, mm. to being a packed stadium that you only see. I guess at championships or at certain diamond leagues. Yeah, because nine times out of ten, when you're that's watching the, the thing we need to think Bridge about why did, why did back in the day, Charles used to be rammed, packed out. They'd packed out Crystal Palace, Loughborough. These yeah, these are used to be on BBC. So where I know the funding and the money and everything, okay, whatever. But in this day and age, you don't need to be a millionaire or have a million pound budget to create exposure on something. If that was the case, none of us would be anywhere because who has the money to push themselves if that's what it solely yeah. relied on. All it needs is a changing of the guard and I think a, um, a refreshment of ideas, bringing in young people and getting yeah. their opinions on things and saying, actually, let's try this push. Let's engage people through our stories or through our polls or through the interview structures we do or through, you know what I mean? Because think about when you're on Instagram. If I'm someone who is pushing something now, I'm gonna think I need to make something that, that that I wouldn't want to scroll past, mm -hmm. essentially, because our our attention span when we're looking at something on Instagram or on Twitter is so small. Yeah. If it doesn't grab you in the first three seconds, you're gonna switch. You're gonna yeah. switch off. Scroll. Now imagine when I when I watch these things, these boxing things, you got Dillian versus Shaw recently, all these boxing things. What they'll have, they'll have a long boring video, mm -hmm. but in that video, someone says something spicy. Yeah. That's what they've captioned it. I'm gonna tear his head off, or what did what did Chisora say? I'm gonna like I'm gonna make him feel like lack laxatives or <laughs> he said something like something stupid, he's gonna poop it himself <laughs> or something crazy right but that's what they stuck to mm. and i watched it because i wanted to realize what the hell made Derek Chisora say this mm. that's why i watched it the gloves are off we don't have an equivalent of the gloves are off we don't have an equivalent of first take why but we're meant to be an elite sport when the world stops every four years the whole world stops for the 100 meters final the world will stop again in two years time in tokyo it will stop but why don't we have, why are we only waiting to that year to push track? Every four what years. happens in the years before? Imagine if you pushed it in the years before, then that year would be even bigger. Yeah. And that's where we're gonna have more sponsors, more engagement, but instead, all we wanna, all we wanna shed light on are the negative people in the sport who are doping, and then that's it. But what about all the positive things that's going on in the sport? No one wants to talk about that. And I just feel like there's doping going on in every sport. Look at John Jones. John Jones has failed more times than I've, I don't even know, like, I can't even know what it's, he's felt so many times and no one ain't really saying that much and he's still allowed to become a heavyweight champion it's and all this interesting stuff. that you say that because that's always a big thing with and it's a big thing with athletics but it's one thing with British athletics that really grinds my gears it's like they have to do everything in their power to make sure you know that this person has done it so I said crazy <laughs> and, it's and like, I'm not and for the thing is I'm not sitting I'm not sitting here advocating for it at all I'm not saying don't shed light on it man it's a calm thing no I'm not saying that yeah, what yeah. I am saying is it doesn't need to be the headlines because the open happens in every walk of life it happens in every sport but mm -hmm. there's a reason why Tyson Fury for instance is winning sportsman of the year moment of the year and getting all these accolades but he's a drug cheat no one is making no noise and I'm not saying we should allow drug cheats to come back and don't shed light on their, on on their, on what's happened to them. Mm. What I am saying is, don't make it the focus. Shed light, don't make it the focus. Don't make it the focus, focus on the, the positive sport. things that's happened in sport. There's so many good things that have happened in 2018. Yet, when you think about track, what you think most things you're going to think about is Russia doping, being banned, so and so did this, Gatlin, blah blah blah. Why are we talking about this? I think that was why 2016 was so big. Yeah. Because the focus was so much on bad guy, good guy. Bad guy, good guy. And, and I get that narrative, but it's only so long see, you can run it. Yeah. That, that, was, that was probably the only time where you've had something like boxing. That was actually 2015, yeah. I think. Yeah. Um, where Beijing. You, where you've had yeah. that, like, okay, this is, this is going to be good because this is a guy who's effectively lost everything, yeah. won everything, lost everything, come back, and seems to be... <laughs> on the way to being a that, real that, challenger. That storyline was sick. I remember watching it that year and, and seeing the final and thinking, Bo, come on, <laughs> that, ah! Because that was... the storyline was litty. I, I rated that, but 
the 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 under the under the underlining tones behind that was doping. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? And I think we can make storylines that are positive that draw attention without it being about drugs. Do what what did Gatlin achieve since he come back? He achieved so many different things. But rather than shine light on that, you're still trying to bring back all these negatives from way back in 2003. Yeah. And, you, and you don't have to you don't have to forgive him. You do not have to forgive him because I'm sure there's a lot of people whose opportunities he took through doping. And I'm, yeah. and I'm never, ever in a million years going to sit here and say, um, oh, people dope, it happens, whatever. No, I'm not saying that. But I feel like if we want us, people are getting upset because the engagement in athletics is going down, the, f the money in the sport is going down, the attractiveness of the sport isn't as it is as isn't what it used to be. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. What do we do about it? And there's and the thing is with our sport, they, we don't have the kind of unison within the athletes to band together and say, actually, maybe we're getting underpaid, or maybe we're not getting opportunities that we should get, or maybe no, we deserve more time on TV. We deserve this. We're not doing that because the person at the top of the tree doesn't give a about the person who's below it and yeah. maybe if I was the person at the top of the tree maybe I wouldn't care because I'm getting looked after and that's calm that's so yeah. I get it I get and it's an individual sport we've got to be for ourselves but I think there's got to be a point where everyone who loves the sport people within the sport and those who want to get involved in the sport we have to all be on the same page and look at it and say actually how do we get the sport back to where it was to the point where you know you got like look at Skepta Skepta put Linford Christie in these lyrics yeah. Like, do you know what I mean? You want to get to the point where someone's going to put you in a lyric. Like, that's how big... That's how big That's how big are. the sport is and that's how big you are. You know how point where... Like, yeah, and this is the thing that makes me laugh, I guess, within the track. Because you see guys and girls who perform sick and they roll around like, I'm the... How do you not know me? Mm. Brother, no one knows you. No one knows you. Just because here people in the centre and everything is seeing your face. We don't know you. When you leave the building or when you leave the athletics kind of environment, mm. no one don't know who the hell you are. And that's the reality of it. It shouldn't be the case, but that's the reality of it right now. Yeah. So, and I don't have, I'm sitting here just spinning off ideas off, top, off the top of my head. I don't have the answers, but you know, as, as an athlete who's heard a lot about how the sport used to be, even if you see YouTube videos and you look at what it used to be like, yeah. it's like, man, like anniversary games this year meant to be basically but probably the biggest diamond league on the circuit. The stadium was 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 not packed out. It was not packed out. Athletics World Cup. It was not. I, I get they had issues with the planning and blah blah blah. Still, if it's a big competition, why is it not packed out? What are you guys doing wrong that you can't sell this out? Give free mm. tickets out to school Give kids. Schools. Yeah, yeah. School I've always kids. said this. <laughs> Give free tickets to kids because if they come and they see someone. Who they can, who they feel as though they can relate to, running fast and getting success, they're gonna think, "Raw, that could be the next Usain Bolt in that stadium." Yeah. Who sees it? Because there was a scheme that um, gave his school or his youth club or whatever free tickets to come and watch the athletics. That's how you fill out stadiums, not by, not by um, advertising the competition to the same crowd every year who are gonna come and do the same every year. Mm -hmm. It's dead. Have trials in another place. Have trials in London. Maybe that might change things. That We're would having, be amazing. Like, it's a quick track as well. It's, yeah, it's so old school and it's so ancient. Like the whole way we do things and it's like, it's just dead. Like, I, but I love track, so I'm not someone who's going to quit track because these things are not happening. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is, you know, where, how, does this sport, how does this sport evolve? That's how does the big it help you to stay in sport? And how, do you, how does it help you young. stay in the sport if, if, when you're young? And that's when what I said earlier. Yeah. If you don't have a contract, when you're young coming through, it's going to be hard. But there aren't other outlets because the sport is still functioning quite amateurly. Mm. There aren't a lot of outlets for you to um, for you to to gain income or to get kind of your foot on the ladder without being the thing straight away. Yeah, and that's the problem. But with football, it's not like that because if you don't get it to the prem, you're going to get into the championship. If you don't get a championship, you're going to have there's going to have there's different. Too. There's different <laughs> there's, you're always going to have a way to have engagement. But with track, it's either you're good or you're not. Yeah. And I get, and I and I appreciate the the I, I appreciate the cutthroat aspect of it, but in the same breath, how do we keep young talent in the sport that maybe haven't blossomed yet? Mm -hmm. Are there more platforms for sponsorship opportunities? I know we have a few in the UK, but again, they're very old school. Yeah. Are there new methods to attract people in? You know, these are the, even the competition structure. So many things that 
we, over time, I think we've got to take a leaf out of the book of other sports. Because look at it, it's like, I'm not even out here trying to cuss other sports here. But like something like a sport like, let me say, um, what sport can I even think of? Like cricket, for instance. That get more clapped than athletics. Yeah. I'm not gonna lie, cricket is more boring than athletics. I'm like, I don't care. Cricket, right, hate, hate me, hate me for saying it. Cricket, right. bowls, I can't invest my it's time. It's boring. I can't invest my time. It's boring. Really Cycling. Can't, can't invest athletics my time. Is, athletics is more entertaining. I think it's a biased opinion, but I, I think athletics is more entertaining than those sports. Yeah. But those sports get more coverage and more exposure and more fun than all the rest of it. But we don't. We're doing something wrong. And I think, uh, you know, at some point, someone's got, someone's got to say something. Someone's got to do something. Because you know, I, this is I, and this is sad, it's sad. I'm saying it, but the way athletics is right now, it's not a sport that if I have a child, I would say yeah, I want you to be a track do star. Do you yeah. know, what I would say I want you to be a footballer because I see more from that than athletics right they now. They get looked after more. They get looked after more. I see more from that than football than football right now. I mean, than athletics right now. And it's I've sad. always said that an incentive should be if you win um, England champs, yeah, you get a a significant amount of kit mm. from British athletes. Yeah, they're obviously they're being looked after by Nike. Mm-hmm, yeah. So and, first, that's, and second, kit drops are not a hard thing to do. First, second, third, you get kit drop. Obviously, mm-hmm. depending on where you come, yeah. depends on what you get. Yeah. That's an that's an incentive right there mm-hmm. for someone to do it. Or yeah. cool, you you won. We're gonna take care of your next five six competitions. Yeah. Because there's no the competitions. Inse- there's no incentive. Are not cheap. No, I'm and, all I, here and luck, I've been so lucky that I've always been in a, pos- in a position where I've had financial support yeah. from an external source that's just funded my dream. Mm. But I've always and I, and I admire people who have second jobs or nine to fives and are still trying to chase this dream because yeah. I know I probably couldn't do that. Like, and or I could do it, but I don't know if I would be still as be successful as I am right now, or still be in a sport because it is difficult and. It's especially difficult when there is an incentive, like you're saying, to, to do it. Yeah. It's like a flex is one of those sports which is which is probably one of one in a sense of you could train for more than you train more than you compete for one. And then not only that, you could train and still not get nothing out of it. Yeah. Imagine that. All the training. All the winter training. All the winter training, the grinding, the sacrificing, the missing out on opportunities in in life because you're chasing this dream Mm -hmm. and you still might not get anything because there can only be eight finalists, three medalists and one champion. So the the rate of failure, the percentage of failure is much more higher than the percentage of success. So it's like, rah, I'm not getting nothing out of this. And people say, oh yeah, but don't chase this and don't chase... The money and don't chase this and that but we've got to work towards something you can't yeah. tell someone to go all, all, all um wholehearted for for free or in the hopes of not getting anything out of it unless it's your hobby yeah then i understand that but it's like people got to be realistic at these the days. Day, you need your financial support, yeah, and you need financial support because unfortunately <laughs> yeah. you know <laughs> dreams don't pay the bills <laughs> dreams don't fund your life we can all dream <laughs> or we can all wake up and make things happen so um that's when it comes to athletics i, I guess to answer your question you know, that's what I think we need to do better. And yeah. either Belayef, you know, I think, and this is, it gets very political because honestly, I guess no one really knows what's happening behind closed, closed doors, doors when it comes to either Belayef, but you know, that I guess they do a good job of, of, they've done a good job of making a Diamond League as prestigious as it is and everything else. And I guess they're doing a good job to a certain degree, but I feel like they can do more for the athletes, I think athletes should be paid more than we're being paid. I think um, the events, like the pride, like the pride, the, the, I saw this on Twitter, I think Tiana Bartolotta was talking about it. Mm. And like, they brought out like the schedule for the World Indoor Tour coming up yeah. and the prize money. And I think it collated to like 20 bags or something like that. And it was like- US or pound? US. But then I guess with, with the exchange rate now, maybe it's not that bad, but still. Yeah. Like what? These world-class athletes are busting their ass yeah, indoors wow. for 20 grand. Do you know, you could go to the US Open or Wimbledon, get battered and make more than that. Are you crazy? And these are the best. This is, this is, this is not if you take part in the tour. This is if you win it. Yeah. You get that. So what happens to the people who didn't win that are just yeah. as good? The baby just came up short. They're walking home with like maybe 10 bags, 8 bags, 7? I'm like, nah. That's why I think Adel Belayef 
could do better. Like, I know the money's somewhere. Yeah. And it's got, like, and this is the thing. I guess if you're the person who's getting the money, you might not complain. But what if, what if you could get more? What if, like, what if you could get more? Yeah. Then would you be happy with, would you be happy with what you're getting right now if you knew there was more out there? That's what I'd say. But these are the powers that, are way above me and my job is just to compete but and you know I sound like I sound like someone who's political and stuff but I, I, don't, I don't want no business in that to be honest I don't want to get involved in that but you know these are the questions I think as athletes we've got to be aware I'm, we boss our ass off but at the end of the day what are you bossing your ass off for mm-hmm. there's got to be an end goal in this do you know what I mean and I just think you know with, with the work we put in with the amount of diligence you've got to have sacrificed everything I think I think we deserve more than what some of us get paid off. So obviously in America you hear about these crazy deals, people get millions of stuff, but it's not yeah. like it's not really like that in Europe. Like I don't know a lot of millionaire athletes like in the European scene, yeah. British scene. I don't know a lot of millionaire athletes, and I know okay, Unless they're the they might not they might not have performed well to deserve that yet. Like, I yeah. understand that, but even when they do, like some of the some of the deals you hear people signing for, it's like, but you have done really well. Why are you signing? Why are you signing for that? And I think that's just where it's at right now, but because if you have friends in like footballers, like your friends that play semi pro, getting way more, more and, and they're sitting thinking, on the bench, yeah, yeah. you're thinking, well, <laughs> you know, that's the equivalent of being a relay runner in a way and not running and getting paid. Getting paid. <laughs> that don't happen for us. But even with the whole contract stuff, it's like again, the athletes are in control because, and this is the thing: when I was younger and we were getting deals, people were still getting signed for like decent amounts of money. Mm-hmm. But like, where it gets for people is that if a junior now comes out and the best junior signs for peanuts everyone else because the brand is going to say well the best of your bunch got this much yeah why the hell am i going to give you that and you we shoot ourselves in the foot so stand for more that's like when i said when i was know your worth i didn't get offered a lot from nike but my dad said to me man this, this still ain't good hold out trust trust in your ability you'll run better next year I ran better and the deal like tripled or quadrupled even. So that's that's the thing. It's like, don't, and, and the thing is, it's a, such a touchy subject because I can't tell you or you what you should sign for, what you should accept when, because I don't know your financial yeah. situation. You of might course. need to provide for your family and whatnot and you need that money now. Can't tell you wait a year for something that might not happen. I yeah. get it. But if you have patience, if you have some sort of belief that you can do it, hold out get what you deserve because it helps everyone in the long run. Because when the guys who came before me were signing for loads, that helped my situation because cause I knew that. Yeah. I could walk in and say, well, actually, I want this. Because I know you gave my man that. Yeah. So you got to give me at least this. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. But then now, if they're signing for peanuts, then I'm Then he's And the brands are walking away with, what, with a bargain. You're getting special specimens yeah. for cheap like, that's like, bro, I don't even know what that's like. That's like, yeah, getting fake Yeezys, bro. And someone's saying, <laughs> your Yeezys are lit. They're yeah. real Yeezys. Fake Yeezys. It's like that. We're not fake Yeezys. We're the real yeah. So pay us like we are. That's, that's what I say. So um, athletes got to take responsibility in that sense as well. Know your worth and surround yourself in a team that's going to help you, you know, get what you, get what you can from the sport, essentially, I guess. What you okay, say. cool. So last, last two questions. Yeah. Um, what advice do you have yeah. for young athletes and the not so young athletes that are still pushing to, yeah. to try to do something with the sport? All right, cool, yeah, perfect. And like I said, no disclaimer, you know, I'm not perfect. I'm not, you know, I'm not the guy that have all the answers. I'm still trying to figure it out myself. But just from, I guess a lot of it is common sense mm-hmm. experience. Yeah. I would say it from, with that lens. Um, for young athletes, I'll say, um, it's really simple. Don't watch. Don't watch what a next man is doing. Like focus on your journey because every journey is different. Um, if someone's achieving, if someone's somewhere today, doesn't mean they're going to be there tomorrow. You mm-hmm. could be there tomorrow. Hold the faith. Hold the vision and keep pushing. And like, I just feel like, especially for those who are good when they're young, take your time. Surround yourself with a good team. A team is important. A team is the difference between you know, winning championships or not winning championships, I think. Yeah. Have a good coach around you, a coach that's honest, a coach that wants the best for you and isn't there for any any other reason. Um, surround yourself with a good, like, unit, a good manager, a good agent, good family members that have your best interest um, 
in mind. And I think if you've got a good team, that's half the battle. Like, you know, yeah. you're giving yourself the best opportunity to perform. So get a good team, be patient, don't watch anyone else and seize the opportunities when you have them. Don't let people tell you you're too young, wait, uh, if you like, or wait till 2024, for instance. If you're good mm -hmm. to go in 2020, go 2020. Because you don't know when you're going to get your next opportunity again. That's how brutal life is. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And for older people, I guess, <laughs> I think because where maybe, I guess my maturity kind of comes into it and common sense on this part, I would just say, um, if you've been doing the same thing for a long time and getting the same results, maybe you should do something different. Mm -hmm. With I say that with the most respect possible. Like, if you keep getting the same results, you keep, you, you're, you're still that same guy or same woman who's coming up short. You're known to be maybe just a relay runner or mm -hmm. you're known for just always bumming out. Maybe you should do something different. Maybe you should reinvent yourself to get something, to get to somewhere you haven't been before. And I think also, um, I feel like people shouldn't get so sucked into this whole, I'm gonna be my peak in my mid twenties mm -hmm. because people develop at different rates. Linford Christie was winning the Olympics late 30s, mid 30s. Yeah. You've seen Gatlin, I know you might have your speculations about how he got there, but he's another, uh, Kim Collins is probably a better example. <laughs> Kim Shout out to Kim Collins. Shout out to Kim Collins. Going, how old is he, like 40? <laughs> he, he was how old like is he? 41, 42. 41. So he, for me, just has like a golden aura about him. Yeah, it's like crazy. To be PB in at the age that he was and it's running crazy. the times that he was, yeah. that's crazy. Like, I don't know if Dwayne's the number that. one, like Dwayne, he's 40. He ran to the and he's day, about to make he? his comeback. He's talking. I mean, he, tra he trains at the Valley, so he's talking to me about he wants to go Europeans and everything. And, and when I see him train, you know, I don't, I don't think he's talking. Shit. Like, I actually think, you know what? Maybe you could. Okay. Um, so watch out for him as well. Um, yeah, I would just say don't put age limits on yourself mm -hmm. just because of what the norm is. The norm there isn't no norm anymore. Bolt did his thing when he was twenty one, twenty two. Yeah. You, um. um the Linford was doing these thing. Carlos was doing a thing later on. So there's different ends of the spectrum. Don't don't limit it to I've got to be a certain age to do this. If I don't, I'm gonna quit. And there's so many people who were only a season away from it, or a race away, or a few weeks away, and they gave up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's that picture on Instagram I always see with someone like underground digging. Yeah. And then gold is like over here, and they dug up until here, and, and then they stopped. walked away. Yeah. That's Keep digging. Goals. That's how. That's what I would say to people who have been in the sport for a long time, maybe necessarily they haven't um, achieved their potential yet. Mm -hmm. Evaluate yourself honestly. Am I where I really need to be? Am I doing everything that I need to do to warrant the results I want? If you are, keep doing it. It will pay off yeah. eventually. If you aren't, rebrand yourself, reinvent yourself, rekindle yourself. Too many people are stuck in their ways and blaming everything else. My coach was doing this. It was windy. That stadium, that track, my spikes, my brand, my mum. Stop blaming people. Yeah. Stop blaming people. Take responsibility. Because at the end of the day, you're the one that goes on the track and performs. Because if you perform well, you would take all the adulation, wouldn't you? Yeah. So now when it goes badly, don't start blaming other people. Be, be consistent with it. Either blame everyone forever. Even when you run fast, I, oh, is your fault I ran fast? Do that. <laughs> Rather than... Yeah. Blaming people when it goes badly and then, you know, but trying you to like, take, take, it on, else. take it on. When it, so that's the thing I've learned as well. Like, just don't, don't blame people. Always blame yourself. Unless someone's really done you dirty, then cool, okay, you've got to pass the bucket a bit. But for the most part, take responsibility. And that way you're going to grow. And I don't think anyone's too young or too grow or too young to keep growing. Like, you could be 40. You, could, you never stop growing until you die. You never stop yeah. growing. Do you know what I mean? So that's what I say to older athletes. Like, I'm sure whoever watches it and sees that I'm young mm -hmm. might not think because I'm sure if I heard a young girl talking I might not listen to it but no I have to listen to it but I think from what I've seen is common sense and I might have yeah. even looked at your career and thought why does person keep on getting bad at this competition every time like, he needs to do something else or she needs to do something else sometimes there's a bit of logic in that you know because well, they might not be wrong I mean there's so many athletes and this is no disrespect to any of them because at the time they were doing their thing mm. there's so many track and field athletes that have gone and found new life in bobsleigh yeah for real there's so many of it's them that have gone and found now. It's quite a and there's a lot and have they have they not lost their funding recently or something like that? i think I so know. yeah so i know it might not something. be as, as attractive now but even still the fact of realizing when it's time to start a new venture yeah understand when to leave 
because some people don't understand when to stop and I, and I, and there's such a fine line between knowing when to stop and still believe and I get it and I'm not trying to be a pessimist and say just give up man like, I'm not going to be like that, that guy but sometimes you've got to know when it's time to just leave it mm-hmm. and go on to another chapter because that chapter could be maybe what your calling really is it might not be track it might be something else and um, that's what I'd say really so um, yeah that's what I'd say all right, well, thank you so much for this very insightful podcast. <laughs> yeah. I, I really can't wait to listen back to this myself. Yeah, same, same. Because <laughs> um, we touched on quite a lot of things. Um, mm-hmm. Could you please do me a favor and plug your social so that anyone yeah. who isn't following you, yeah. they can go and do that? Well, my Instagram is really simple now. I got them to change it recently. So okay. it's just O-J-I-E, that's it. Very simple. So if you can't follow that, then you're just a snake. <laughs> like, you're just a snake. So follow that. Um, and on my Twitter, it is O J I E underscore a double N E D O B U R U N. I'm not really on Twitter too much, so you're better off following me Instagram. on Instagram. That's really where it's popping. So yeah, follow we'll me. We'll try to tag it somewhere. I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Follow, follow me on there, <laughs> and then you just see everything that I'm doing. And we'll probably put his um, YouTube channel as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna try and put some more stuff up on my channel. Um, this some season. Good stuff on there. Yeah, really so nice. I've got a few training videos and whatnot. But yeah, just look out for me for this season and beyond. So yeah. Ah, lastly, um, before we go, what is your main target okay. for this season? Well, the first target coming up is obviously the European Indoor Championships. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm feeling really confident about that. Feeling really positive about that. And um, for me, it, it, I know everyone's kind of like, "Oh, why are you doing indoors? It's a long year." Blah blah blah. And I, I get that, but. I feel like if you're someone who maybe like a Dino or maybe like a, I would say Felix or someone who's a, a, a champion at something mm-hmm. or you've done really well, I understand the reasoning for wanting to, to 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 push out your season yeah. of start like starting your season a bit further because really and truly you've displayed countless times the ability to make a team to perform at that level, so take your time. But if you're someone who hasn't done anything, which is the case for a lot of us. I don't get the whole what you, like holding back. Like, what are you holding back for? You haven't done anything yet. So I yeah. think you need to get out there and race. So for me, but with that being said, do what you want. Yeah. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But for me, like I need to build up, I need to build up a report of um, senior individual performances before I get to the big stage. So a European Championships indoors, one is an opportunity for me to work on the first half of my race and yeah. kind of working on becoming a more complete sprinter. But it's an opportunity to be in a championships, learn the lessons and the knocks and everything, good or bad, that come yeah. with it, and use that to grow in confidence and help me be better prepared for the outdoor competition. So yeah, Europeans is the first one. Obviously, I want to make the team for the 100 meters in Doha. And um, that'll be my target to just, I, yeah, I haven't even thought that far when it comes to Doha, but I just know I want to compete to the best of my ability. And whatever that translates into, I'm sure it will, I'm sure it will be representative of, of what I've done in 2019. So I just want to run faster, get under 10 seconds and just keep this train moving towards Tokyo and beyond, to be honest. Cool. Oh, good luck. I'm very best to you for that. <laughs> we hope to see you in Tokyo. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. That's the aim. That is the aim. Thank you so much for being our first ever guest. We look forward to having you again at some point in the very near future. I am DJ Armani alongside my host Victor. And we will be seeing you guys shortly. Athletics Productions, follow it. Shaku, 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 shaku